an elusive phantom of hope, a critique of reformism by Kyle Reardon, forward by Shane Radliff. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, share alike 4.0 international license. Any other content within this work that may not be covered by this CCBY NCSA license is hereby used under the intention of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. Forward. Fortunately, reformism has been much of a burden to my time and efforts. I voted once at age 19, attended an overpasses for Obama's impeachment that same year, and the next year I held an informational protest against the war on drugs. As far as reformism goes, I've been quite lucky to not have wasted too much of my precious time. But some have not been so lucky. There are a lot of people who believe that their methods are the ones that will work. Whether it is voting, jury nullification, protesting, debating, or running for public office, these folks think that through their methods, they can institute positive change and minimize the damage that the state inflicts upon its unlucky subjects. Although their efforts are more than likely good intentioned, they are actually having a negative impact on the change they are trying to create. I've ass assisted Kyle with this anthology as much as I possibly could have and could not be happier with the result. It is surely the most extensive and comprehensive collection of articles, completely debunking every aspect of reformism. As an anarchist, it's repulsive to see so many people stuck inside this paradigm that the only way to impact change is to do it by political means. So many people abandon their philosophical principles because they feel there is no other way out. But no more. Anyone who reads this anthology will realize that working inside this system is no way out, and is only giving legitimacy and credibility to the most dangerous superstition. Those who read this will begin to see an actual, realistic way out. It is my hope that this anthology impacts as many people as it did me. If there is one piece of work that will do it, it is this one. To paraphrase Albert J. Nock from his book, Our Enemy the State, there are the political means and the economic means of making money. Too many people who claim to want freedom want to use the political means of making money, and the results have shown that that is, that that is not possible. The answer to reformism is direct action. Shane Radliff, Bloomington, Illinois, Liberty Under Attack. Should You Avoid the News? Originally published at the Last Bastille blog on July 1st of 2013, read to you by the author. Throughout history, there have been individuals who had a vested interest in whipping up hysteria amongst the domestic population. By gaining agalopolistic control of the means of communication, these con artists now have the ability to monitor the populace into whatever direction they should so wish. Despite efforts to circumvent this control, it would unfortunately seem to be the case that a related breed of confidence men do the same thing against American dissidents by pretending to be one of us, all the while directing us down paths that are either ineffectual or counterproductive. In light of the various subversions within the alternative media, the veracity of attempting to exercise the liberty of the press is now brought into question. Although the impetus to circumvent the mainstream media, MSM, is certainly a good one, I am less than impressed with how the Patriot rock stars have mangled the message of liberty, to say the least. What needs to be determined is that, considering the carousel of carnivores, should American dissidents avoid the news? Rolf Dobelli's essay, Avoid News Towards a Healthy News Diet, gives 15 reasons why he thinks the consumption of news is useless and even harmful. Many, if not all, of these reasons are also echoed by Martigen Sherp. Briefly, these reasons could be highlighted thusly. News skews risk analysis. News is irrelevant. News fails to explain the underlying processes. News is physiologically harmful. News feeds confirmation bias. News encourages shallow thinking. News is addictive. News increases opportunity costs. 
News divorces reputation from achievement. News suffers from a lack of verification. News forecasts are always wrong. News is a venue for corporate bias. News reinforces learned helplessness. News projects a false sense of caring. And news kills creativity. Initially, this sounds completely plausible, but perhaps it would be a good exercise of due diligence to really evaluate these claims made by Dobelli and Sherp. As a good friend of mine has incessantly reminded me, there's always two sides to every story. Now first, it is important to understand the current playing field by keeping your ears open, lest you caught, be caught unawares of what the establishment is doing against you. Second, it would be the height of foolishness to limit, <laughs> to limit yourself to one source, even within dissident alternative media circles. Since this only makes you susceptible to the problem of the six blind men and the elephant. Again, this is why it's imperative to shop around, as it were, because of corporate and governmental agendas. It's not as if Dobelli and Sherp were completely wrong, however. Insincere narratives woven together by self-declared intelligentsia want to do your thinking for you, instead of providing you with an explanation of the underlying processes at work. All they can really tell you is that something happened. Shallow thinking is certainly an epidemic of sorts because people don't think, especially considering the effects of because YouTube said so. This is exacerbated by the lack of due diligence, as exemplified by the claims that the Sandy Hook school shooting was somehow a hoax. And predictive forecasts really are always totally wrong. Yet there are some, perhaps unwitting, misconceptions promulgated by Dobelli and Chirp. For instance, these claims of physiological harm seem to me to be akin to the reasoning used by peaceful parenting advocates to explain why they abhor spanking. Both neglect to mention that exercise, as a form of stress, increases muscle size and is thus beneficial for healthy growth. Opportunity costs only arise from the lack of self-control. That is, the news junkies' lack of focus is, in fact, a problem of their own making. And thus, such opportunity costs are not the fault of the news. Otherwise, such a pseudo-justification could be applicable to quite just about everything or anything. You have to keep in mind that news junkies react without thinking, hence why they usually have pretty bad cases of the victim mentality. It's not as if the carousel is innocent of forming their own celebrity culture given the very existence of the patriot rock stars themselves. These rock stars are also the same individuals responsible for projecting a public image of themselves as caring about the principles of liberty, all the while leading us down the road of perdition. I view this as the quintessential reason to embrace your own folk and the actual people in your life, rather than give any sort of serious credence to the babbling of some self-made pundit. Finally, the news kills curiosity, not creativity. If you're so scared or cynical that you acquiesce to becoming a couch potato, then it's your own damn fault for not following up on leads for those stories that interest you. A few more observations are in order that neither the MSM nor the carousel would care to divulge. It would be foolish to underestimate the effectiveness of the prima facie story tactic. That is a deliberate obfuscation of the facts that leads the consuming audience into a condition that Gary Hunt has called befuddlement, which is essentially the marriage between cognitive dissonance and information overload. Put another way, there is so much data the audience can't interpret that they eventually throw their hands up in the air and acquiesce to whatever the self-selected pundits chose to promulgate this week. Equally foolhardy would be to ignore the McVeigh syndrome, which is the bravery at a distance, usually exhibited by the rock stars and their sycophants, as demonstrated most recently by their con condemnation of the Hatari militia. So, what is one to do? I think it really depends upon your goals. If your aim is to achieve peace of mind by conscientiously avoiding exposure to sensationalistic garbage, then yes, I would wholeheartedly suggest that you do what Dobelli initially recommends by completely cutting out all news consumption. However, if your goal is to counter the MSM, 
then what you should be doing instead is looking at all the uh, <laughs> is looking at all all the sides of a story from as many primary sources as possible before forming a judgment. Obviously, this is quite difficult to do individually and is best done in a collective effort of some kind, perhaps in the form of a verification clearinghouse. How is one to apply these suggestions, though? Dobelli advises us to read books, magazines, and trade journals instead, as well as the need to talk to friends and family. The problem with these recommendations is that since the news is time-dependent, unless you're reading an investigative expose, your circle of personal contacts, more likely than not, are getting their information from the very same news services that you are abstaining from in the first place. Perhaps a better avenue is to verify the sources for yourself, and the first steps to doing this in a cooperative manner is the Committee of Digital Correspondence. They are still seeking correspondence, so if you want to write sourced articles for them, they would be happy to publish high-quality reporting. Ultimately, I have a sinking feeling that most dissidents I've talked with over the years aren't truly interested in tackling the MSM, despite their reactive Ralphie impressions to the contrary. What comes across clear as day is their desire to simply not be bombarded with corporatist agendas, in which case I will recommend to them my thoughts as a refinement upon Dobelli's suggestions. Cut down on how much time and effort you spend reading, listening, and or watching the MSM and the carousel, and instead spend that time writing book reports, like I do, since I think you're much more likely to find sources for the truth in carefully researched, though possibly dated, books, rather than incomplete and misleading news articles, radio broadcasts, or video press releases. Perhaps then you'll start to realize that it's not necessarily the truth, but your own personal liberty that matters. You've just heard, Should You Avoid the News, originally published in the Last Best Deal blog on July 1st of 2013, and read to you by the author. Debating Does Not Work, originally published at the Last Best Deal blog on August 7th of 2012, read to you by the author. We continually hear from various alternative media pundits that in order to take our country back, we need to win the info war by verbally bludgeoning the mainline public into seeing through the fog. One such method for doing this is by engaging in fruitless arguing over specific issues, even when there is a fundamental difference in worldviews. All too often this results in needless confusion, destructive balkanization, and mental exhaustion. Regardless of whether it occurs over email lists, forum boards, comment threads, video responses, live internet radio streams, or even face-to-face -face meetings, debating with another individual with whom you disagree on fundamentals is literally retarded. <laughs> it is very unlikely that you will persuade someone to much of anything all the while, it is very likely you will end up pissing off everyone, yourself included. Had you simply inquired into their ideology, that by itself should answer most of your potential questions. Unless you are asking clarifying questions, preferably without expressing your own thoughts, on a given subject with the goal of trying to more fully understand their position, then any sort of discourse is going to be patently unproductive for all participants involved. If you think I'm exaggerating, or just being plain too cynical, it would behoove you to notice what happened when those voluntarists debated some socialists at the uh, Cafe Libertalia in San Diego two years ago in um, 2010. Keeping in mind that it was a formal debate, my chief criticism of it was not really seeing what exactly was accomplished, if anything. I noticed that once the two, <laughs> I noticed that once the uh, two debate teams hit an impasse, the entire event began degrading into a combination of repetitive slogans and silly hypotheticals that did anything but clarify where either of them were really coming from. Of course, since I understood their respective ideologies beforehand, I more or less knew what was being left out. Too many times have I have observed flame wars on the information superhighway. Everything from spanking young children to public school students ridiculing a bus monitor 
to how to treat sexual dysfunction has been debated up and down the line without any sort of real conclusion, consensus, or even just plain clarification. Moderators use such tenuous situations to worsen balkanization by playing fast and loose with their site's uh, <laughs> terms and conditions regarding acceptable behavior by arbitrarily removing one of the parties involved, usually the one they already disagreed with, of course. All such discussion of that kind only gives rise to sanctioned bullying. I found it humorous, in a very macabre way, when Brenda Huffman asserted that political debate is actually healthy. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, granted, the liberty of free speech is paramount, but the issue here is not that, but instead whether reckless debating and ridiculous argumentation actually moves the case forward for securing our liberties. Huffman's sugarcoating of how vociferous political engagement by expelling a, garg a gargantuan amount of hot air that increases carbon footprints, which I am all for, is completely disingenuous. People are pissed off, and rightly so, about the, gov about the establishment's increasingly heavy-handedness. Fever-pitched debates are symptomatic of an incredibly worsening situation, just as the one that... <laughs> the founders were forced to contend with. What really gets me is that at the end of the day, what was truly accomplished? So you have some passionate guys yell, or type quickly, at each other about what seems to be some abstract, opaque phenomenon in the eyes of John Q. Public. If the goal was to persuade people and change their minds, how can that be measured? By virtue of the fact that it isn't measured, as well as the emotive drama that necessarily accompany such debates, it would seem to suggest that the real motive behind such farcical argumentation is not in what it, uh, <laughs> it purports to accomplish, but instead was no more than an exercise in self-aggrandizement. Even arguing with people whom you do, who do agree with you on essential concepts is unnecessarily risky, unless you either have the skill or talent for diplomacy, which most people don't. It would be foolhardy to alienate good contacts prematurely. Instead, give them some literature and allow them to convert themselves. Such interpersonal one-on-one -on -one mentoring is actually quite effective, but admittedly, it is nowhere near being as sexy or dramatic as getting people throwing chairs. You just heard Debating Does Not Work, originally published at the Last Bestial blog on August 7th of 2012, read to you by the author. Should you write a letter to the editor? An article published originally at the Last Bestial blog on May 15th of 2013. Many activists over the years have suggested to their respective audiences that one of the things they can do to be engaged and active in the political arena is to write a letter to the editor of a newspaper. Interestingly, they do so flippantly, never evaluating the effectiveness of such a method. Unfortunately, the truth in many situations, such as this one, is quite nuanced. A widespread assumption within various dissident circles is that it is still desirable to use the mainstream media to our advantage in much the same way a gorilla feeds off the captured supplies of his imperial enemy. The real question, though, is just how effective is this gorilla infowar tactic? Realize first that there is a very low probability that any letter you write to the editor will end up getting published. And second, even if the paper in question has a pretty wide circulation, how do you measure how many people actually read it? Any sort of market feedback is more accurate and reliable in the alternative media than anything in the uh, <laughs> lamestream dinosaur talking bobbleheads can provide to you. Modern self-publishing technology now guarantee the availability of the tools needed to exercise the use of the proverbial soapbox, whereas letters to the editor are simply asking for permission to speak. Does only concentrating on activities like blogging, podcasting and videography unnecessarily limit yourself to a niche market? 
Sure, it possibly can, but at least you know the numbers of hits and views. Even then, it is still open for your detractors to comment, unlike the corporate whore papers. There are also the privacy implications to consider. Benjamin Franklin was able to write letters to the editor of the New England Current under the alias of Silas Duguid, thereby portraying himself as a very opinionated widow, yet he was never once asked, Your papers, please! James Wesley Rawls has recommended people to use a pseudonym when writing letters to the editor, since he is concerned about infosec. So you would think it is relatively easy to do so, given both these historical and contemporary examples. Right? Sadly, such is not at all the case here. Just by concentrating on a smattering of local newspapers here in Austin, as well as different local newspapers in other cities that served as a type of control group, I was able to determine that it is literally impossible to anonymously write anything to the editor and expect a fair gamble at getting it published. Now granted, papers are free to publish whatever letters they receive, but what I object to here is the constant policy of them either demanding some combination of your legal name, physical or mailing address, and or telephone number before you are allowed to submit your letter for potential publication, or otherwise asking you for these details after they've made the decision to publish your letter, yet still make it only a conditional acceptance as such, depending on the individual newspaper, of course. If you think I am overreacting to this overtly corporatist behavior, consider what happened to Michael Kuzman back in 1981. He wrote a letter to the editor of a local paper expressing his personal views about what some would think of as a controversial political topic. As a direct result of the publication of his letter, the Criminal Investigation Division of the IRS conducted a four-day surveillance operation on Mr. Kuzman and his family. Now, what crime was he suspected of committing? We will probably never know for sure, but what is crystal clear here is that writing a letter to the editor, especially in the context of exercising political speech, which was supposed to be legally protected by the First Amendment, makes you a target for political persecution, hence the need to be able to publish anonymously, which the mainstream media has now made it virtually impossible to do. Welcome to Police State America. Probably a nearly untouched upon aspect regarding the validity of writing a letter to the editor is, what exactly is the goal here? Is it to win over hearts and minds? Is it a naive attempt to somehow recruit people to join your particular organization? Or is it simply an opportunity for self-aggrandizement? Comparing this with writing your Congress critter, consider the respective audiences. Congressional staff members who shoot back out a standardized form letter, or random people who in all probability are at least apathetic, if not outright hostile to what you have to say. True, those random people are a noticeably larger sampling than just a few congressional staff aides, but at least you can determine the results of such letters. That is, how the congressman voted on particular bills versus pretty much nothing at all. I am not implying anything statist here. I'm simply pointing out that the feedback for the government version is much more reliable and accurate than the corporatist flavor. And more importantly, the free market alternative media has the best feedback of all, thus vastly surpassing the other two. During the, ra during the constitutional ratification period of the late 1780s, Americans had a reason to care about what was happening around them. They had just won a bloody seven-year war for their independence in order to try something distinctly new, and they didn't want to leave to chance anything that could bollocks it all up. It was at this pivotal time in American history that letters to the editor framed the public discourse, thus determining in many ways how the delegates to the state conventions were to vote on ratification of the federal constitution. An anthology of these letters in favor of the constitution were collectively published as the Federalist Papers. It wasn't until much later that those letters published at the time in various newspapers critical of the Constitution were somewhat haphazardly compiled into what, became a, into what eventually became known as the Anti-Federalist Papers. 
seeing that such aliases as Publius and the Federal Farmer were used, I sincerely doubt those writers were obliged to reveal their personal identities as a condition of actual or even likely publication. We have lost something very precious to the American experience, that is, the ability to use pen names in writing letters to the editor in order to express politically controversial thoughts. Thankfully, we have the internet as a tool with which to exercise our liberty of free speech, but we shouldn't have had to rely on it so much. It doesn't negate the fact that the incessant policy of the media corptocracy is to elicit from us our real identities as a, pre as a precondition for publication. Such information is, of course, used for profitable data mining purposes, contrary to what their alleged privacy policies may ostensibly say. So what can be done as an alternative to writing letters to the editor of a corporatist publication? You could do what many people in the alternative media did back in the 90s before the internet went big and write a letter to the editor of a newsletter, such as the former American Sentinel or Sobrands. Another option is to treat those letters to the editor the same as uh, those to Congress critters and simply mail them brightly colored postcards. Since it is now common for there to be word limits, you might as well take advantage of the situation and act in accordance with it, for you will not be granted the privilege of writing even half the length of Agrippa's letters. I also recommend writing your own book reports exposing the evils of the establishment, and this can be accomplished by posting them on discussion forum boards, by blogging, or perhaps even by microblogging. Thomas Jefferson once said, I'd rather have newspapers and no government than government and no newspapers. While I can appreciate the sentiment, I think even he could understand why I cannot agree with his preference for my own nuanced reasons. At this juncture, I would rather bypa bypass these newspapers and even the internet to some degree by giving people who live near me locally some literature and allowing them to, shall we say, convert themselves instead of uselessly debating with them using the soapbox. The carnival of distractions, or shall I say the carousel of carnivores that has infected the alternative media, has wrought enough damage by wasting valuable human time and energy into ineffective and even counterproductive tasks. I think it is high time for my fellow bloggers to expose them for their misdeeds by writing audio timelines, thereby documenting their foolish talk for those who bother to read and hopefully by demonstrating the foolishness of such techniques like writing Congress critters or editors much of anything, we can then regroup and begin to ascertain how to more effectively secure our common liberties. This article was originally published on the Last Bestio blog back in May 15th of 2013, and it is entitled, Should You Write a Letter to the Editor? Writing Your Congressman Does Not Work, originally published at the Last Bastille blog on May 22nd of 2012, read to you by the author. July 15th, 2015 update. This article has been substantially changed since its original publication three years ago. Grammar has been heavily edited for clarity, and the material that has been added, if anything, only reinforces the proposed hypothesis. Most alternative media websites instruct their audiences on how to write to their congressman, all the while pontificating the virtues of its alleged efficacy. Such fallacious advocacy permeates the remnants of the free press, most of whom actually know better, but for some inane reason, persist in recommending to others that they should waste their valuable time and effort on a technique that systematically fails to deliver measurable results in the cause for liberty. Believing in the civic fairy tale that politely requesting a legislator who imagines himself to be your ruler to abide by his oath of office through opposing unconstitutional legislation is just as constructive as thinking that cancer can be inexplicably reformed. 
legislators are not constitutionally required to accept your mail, much less answer you, or otherwise perform whatever you wish them to do. Just because citizens have a constitutionally recognized ability to petition the government for a redress of grievances does not therefore mean legislators have a corresponding duty to respond back to you. Any responses you receive back from any of them should be considered within the bounds of polite etiquette. Consider also the difficulty of proportionality experienced by these Congress critters. In 2013, the total United States population of voting age, that is over 18 years old, was, approximate, was approximately 243,703,099 people. And the total Texas population of voting age that same year was projected to be 19,518,666 individuals. If you know that the entire United States Congress has only 535 voting members and that the entire Texas legis legislature has only 181 voting legislators, then what this means is that the ratios of representation can be calculated out to be one Congress critter for every 455,519 U.S. citizens and one Texan legislator for every 107,837 Texans. Obviously, in light of these ratios between legislators and citizens, it becomes literally impossible for every letter received to be answered. Thus, an automated process was born. What happens is that the legislative staff categorizes letters into a dichotomous typology of pro-whatever and anti-something, types in your name at the top of the pre-written standard form letter, and returns that to you. This is all based on the assumption that the Congress Critters staff got not only the subject matter correct, but also accurately recorded which side of a political issue you were on in the first place. <laughs> yup, that's right. It's been well known by those who have worked inside the legislative branch of government that such mishaps as these are all too common. The truth of the matter is that writing to a politician is, in fact, a purposefully designed confidence trick. You are supposed to emotionally invest yourself in the notion that your Congress critter represents your interests, where, truth be told, they just don't give a damn. Every minute spent on working inside the system in order to change it from within, that is, the political means of making money, is every moment not being spent on doing something actually productive towards making humanity freer. Contemplate also the implications to your privacy should you ever write a Congress critter. They'll have your mailing address from the envelope and quite possibly enough information from your letter with which to unjustly profile you as a political undesirable. As long as they don't accuse you of terrorism, then perhaps writing Congress critters although it incurs opportunity costs, shouldn't land you in a government dungeon. Being the good scientist I am, I decided to conduct my own experiment of sorts by writing some Congress critters on two different political issues. In 2013, I opposed both CISPA and the Federal Congress and the grandparent access legislation in the Texas legislature. The postcards I sent to the applicable Congress critters which are pictured in the actual article, were much less time-consuming than if I had written letters and then placed them into envelopes, as well as being much more privacy-friendly. Thankfully, CISPA died in committee, as was the similar fate with the grandparent access statute, yet Fight for the Future had recently warned that CISPA is not dead. I think this shows exactly the problem with writing Congress critters at all. Even if your letter is correlated to the fate of a bill, there is nothing preventing the same legislation to be packaged differently and pass into law at a later time. Unless you are willing to dedicate yourself into becoming a watchdog, there is absolutely no way for your average Joe to keep on top of the legislative branch for any American government. 
There are, however, some slight exceptions to the historical observation that writing to a Congress critter does not work. They are, if you're a lobbyist, if you're a celebrity, if you're a massive campaign contributor, or if the Congress critter does not possess the incumbency advantage for the next electoral cycle, which is rare. For those who can't bear to not write their Congress critter, the next best thing is to mimic, to mimic my example by sending brightly colored postcards, scrawled with pithy statements either in support of or opposition to a particular bill. Better yet would be to ask them stupidly polite questions wherein any real answer would betray the facade of their very representation. Such uncomfortable questions and any subsequent replies should be published in corporate media newspapers as well as any alternative media outlets that care to expose the opportunity costs and hypocritical futility of reformism itself. You've just heard Writing Your Congressman Does Not Work, originally published at the Last Bastille blog on May 22nd of 2012 and read to you by the author. Petitioning Does Not Work, originally published at the Last Bastille blog on May 11th of 2013, read to you by the author. Reformism is all about working within the system that you have inherited. You follow the rules of that government, no matter how arbitrarily chaotic or conspiratorially despotic they are, in the hope that you can eventually turn it against its own nature and towards whatever it is that you want instead. Sadly, it is neither guaranteed nor even probable that such measures will actually work in achieving your goals. Petitions are little more than attempts at begging a particular type of government agent, usually a legislator, to please be nice to you and not act as dictatorial as he presumably otherwise would be if you had not begged him. In fact, Ballantyne's Law Dictionary, 3rd edition, defines a petition in part as a formal request in writing addressed to one in a position of authority. Wait a moment. So even by drafting and sending this type of legal document, the petitioner implicitly recognizes the alleged authority of the government agent in question? This presents a rather interesting conundrum, for if you choose to not recognize such authority, wouldn't petitioning a legislator either reveal your ineptness or even worse, deliberate hypocrisy? The First and Ninth Amendments to the U.S. Constitution state that, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right to the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Close quote. Sections 27 and 29 of the Texas Bill of Rights declare that, quote, The citizens shall have the right in a peaceable manner, to assemble together for their common good, and apply to those invested with the powers of government for redress of grievances to other purposes by petition, address, or remonstrance. To guard against transgressions of the high powers herein delegated, we declare that everything in this Bill of Rights is exempted out of the general powers of government and shall forever remain inviolate, and all laws contrary thereto, or to the following provisions, shall be void." Close quote. So, while it is true that you have the liberty to petition the government for a redress of your grievances, what it doesn't mean is that they are obligated to obey your demands or listen to you in any way. In fact, they are at liberty to completely ignore you. The only problem here is that if they do that too often, much at the expense of the common people for the benefit of the wealthy corporatist special interests, the legitimacy of their bond of representation with the population comes into question 
which is where we find ourselves today. Whether it be the federal Congress or your respective state legislatures, legislators have no to little incentive to listen to anything you have to say, much less give you the time of day. As I have mentioned before on the topic of writing your congressman, unless you qualify in one of those exceptional categories, which by default most people don't, a legislator is not going to take you seriously. The closest foot in the door exception would be to become a grassroots lobbyist. But even that too presents both logistical and ethical problems in terms of, <laughs> in terms of securing your liberty. Unless your financial coffers are bursting to the seams from the many donations of liberty lovers who aren't beholden to, to corporate special interests, then you might be a serious contender against the professional lobbyists. Otherwise, you'd be better off staying home and flushing your Federal Reserve notes down the toilet. At least that way, you can save yourself the time and aggravation of negotiating with Congress critters. Why does the alternative media push the use of petitions so hard for nearly everything? I suspect many genuine individuals naively think that if they focus the audience's attention upon a safe measure for whatever is ailing the body politic this week, then they will be doing them a kindness, even with something that is guaranteed to fail in achieving its stated goals. Ironically, nothing is more cruel than fostering a false hope in the minds of those who truly yearn for their liberty. Some even advocate the use of petitions, not for their original purpose in making substantive political change within the government, but as a propaganda tool to grab mainstream media attention. Needless to say, if you require the corporate horror media to spread the message of liberty, then we might as well pack up all our toys and go home to stay for the rest of our days. Because that kind of dependence is not within any sane realm of reality for what we have to deal with in terms of at least trying to shrink this leviathan we are all suffering under. Some might be hesitant about filing petitions because of the privacy implications of doing so. Regardless of how any petition is written and delivered, it is still a legal document, and as such, the use of aliases or the implementation of other typical infosec measures cannot be used, since everything here has to be done completely above board. Having said that, I don't think it is wise to sign your name onto every petition that vaguely sounds good. It would behoove you to at least read the petition before you sign it, lest you become a foolish stooge in a Mark Dice type petition uh, hoax video. What has been the track record of petitions thus far? Have they increased or restored anyone's liberty or property? It would seem to be the case that they have fallen through the cracks of modern history by being systematically ignored by those very government agents who have it within their power to act on them, and, it bears repeating, they have no incentive to do so. As Albert Einstein famously quipped, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Online petitions have been all the rage as of late. Following the alleged re-election of Barry Obama, there was a flurry of digital petitions about all sorts of topics, but some of the more noticeable ones centered around the theme of begging the White House to allow their respective state governments to peacefully secede from this highly overrated union. As you can no doubt probably infer, nothing happened although some of the older heads within the Patriot community reasonably speculated that everyone who signed one of those digital secession petitions are likely by now to be on some police state watch list somewhere. Even before the White House digital secession petitions took off, there was an activist group being promoted by the Carnival of Distractions known as Food and Water Watch, FWW. Unfortunately, the Take Action page for this organization was nothing anything more active than encouraging their readership to fill in the email contact forms for various single issue items. While they may have had the best of intentions, I seriously doubt any of those single issue items are going to be resolved in any manner. 
despite F FWW's previous claims, where they tooted their own horn about their previous victories. Ultimately, how do, we, how do we measure the contemporary effectiveness of petitioning the government for a redress of our grievances? Well, as I am sure that it is easier to data mine and profile digital petitioners, it also makes it easier for any legislative staff to ignore. When contrasted with paper petitions, it is revealed that not only the latter affords greater privacy protection, but also a marked increase in, at the very least, the probability that some random staff member will actually read the damn thing. The real trick here, though, is in getting actual feedback, which is unusually difficult. Generally speaking, you are inherently relying on either receiving a letter back, typically in the form of a standard, totally non-informative letter, or acting as a watchdog by regularly checking up on floor votes in the Congress. It goes almost without saying, that the latter method is the only reliable one that tells you just how effective your petition was, but it requires quite a bit of due diligence in constantly checking the congressional record. If anyone were actually serious about petitioning the government for a redress of their grievances, the best one I have found for doing so is the You Have Tread on Me Under One Banner Petition. A major drawback of single-issue petitions is that they may appeal to some but not to others. By contrast, multi-issue petitions are automatically more likely to attract large numbers of signers and thus have more of an effect. Petitions should also be solution-focused in their wording, otherwise they will not be taken to heart and treated seriously. Best of all, the under one banner petition is a paper petition, which means you would have to sign it using an actual pen. Not only that, it is also preferable to hand-deliver three copies of this petition to your congressional representative and two U.S. senators each, falling back on snail mail only as a last resort. At the end of the day, though, do petitions actually work? Gauging from previous history, as well as how they have been further bastardized by the onset of the so-called online petitions, I'm just going to go ahead and say no. Omnibus bills and writers grafted onto unrelated pieces of legislation continue unabated, completely unaffected by pitiful begging to discontinue such practices. Such behavior is firmly entrenched in the district of criminals, and sadly in many, if not nearly all, of the state legislatures as well. It would be folly for us to assume this late in the game, that it is still possible to put an end to tyrannical government by begging them to be a little nicer to us even in the context of a support mechanism. At this juncture, nothing less than working outside of the system is going to provide even a modicum of a chance for us to possibly secure our liberties. You've just heard Petitioning Does Not Work, originally published at the Last Bastille blog on May 11th of 2013 and read to you by the author. Voting does not work. Originally published at the Last Bastille blog on June 1st of 2012. Read to you by the author. The greatest tyranny is the tyranny of malicious illusion. Endorsing organized coercion by pretending it is somehow voluntary is not just unconscionable, but downright cruel. Deceitfully passing off vice as virtue is the last thing that truly consistent political dissidents would want to risk doing, lest they be discovered to be just as hypocritical as those they intend to defeat. In order for a republic to work, the populace must be competent enough to elect representatives to the legislature. Considering the various statistics and research studies suggesting that the majority of Americans are incompetent buffoons, courtesy of the public fool system, this would indicate such a high level of ineptness to the point that these are exactly the type of fools who would be easily conned into supporting a politician through emotional rhetoric instead of based on rational criteria. Other social science research shows that people who lack expertise in a given subject, in this case politics, are too incompetent to gauge the quality of whether anyone is qualified for public office. Worse, they are so incompetent to the point that they can't even accurately estimate the severity of their own ineptness, 
always overinflating their performance on various tasks. Another study revealed that political partisans, when presented with objective facts, will twist those in such a manner as to hang on to those facts that support their preconceived notions while conveniently ignoring the rest of them. According to psychiatrist Scott Peck, there exist only a fortunate few who are able to successfully avert this self-delusional trap and thus possess the best chance of being even somewhat objective. I think it is fair to declare at this point that most American voters are an uneducated, slovenly mob instead of being an enlightened, rational citizenry. Voter fraud is an all too well-known topic, yet for some idiotic reason, many political dissidents still think that they can elect their preferred messianic figure despite this. Ballot results are relatively easy to forge. Electronic voting machines just made the fraud that much easier than the traditional paper ballots, which actually required some creative accounting skills to pull off. There have been provable incidents where particular agents of the state don't actually deserve their jobs, even according to the government's own rules. Thus, the air of legitimacy, which was already incredibly thin, totally evaporates. Similar to how congressional aides regularly don't correctly record which side of a political issue geographical constituents are on in the first place, it's not that all uncommon for votes to be misrecorded either. Regardless of when voting officials actually do record results even halfway accurately, they admittedly keep databases on voting histories, so-called enhanced voter files, with the explicit intention of profiling voters for the next electoral cycle. Everyone who chooses to vote is getting their individual voter files data mined by both the Democrats and the Republicans. Voting encourages compromise by instilling in the body politic the supposed necessity of selecting between the lesser of two evils. Besides the fact that the lesser of two evils is still evil, defensive or protest voting only serves to perpetuate the illusion that if you vote against a candidate, you're really voting for his opponent. Such a fallacious notion really belongs in the wasteland of failed ideas, for the history of human experience testifies to the antithesis of that thought. Downs's median voter theorem narrows the range of options down to a set of strict binary choices that are, in fact, so very similar to each other as to be nearly indistinguishable in substance, even though they may seem superficially dissimilar. Any other choices that may be presented from time to time are not given equal weight as the two primary darlings are. The left-right paradigm manipulates the median voter theorem so as to artificially limit the serious political candidates to those who are beholden to the dual hegemonic political parties. The most generous individual vote strength percentage I've ever seen is 0.0253% which is attributable to the average UK voter. For Americans, one forum discussion thread centered on the ever-shifting variables of the sample size of eligible voters, the turnout of those voters, and whether the contested area is in a swing state. A figure of 0.00086% was given, but that was attributed to only those who voted early and often. What I found most revealing was the chap who invented the voter power index, admitting that single member plurality voting is profoundly undemocratic and betrays the fundamental principle of democracy. One person, one vote. The point here is that holding all the other variables constant, individual vote strength percentages are so absurdly minuscule as to be essentially inert. Some would argue that if the voting system were anything other than winner-take-all, then election results would reflect the will of the people and thus be truly representational. Typically utilizing a multi-party structure, proportional representation, PR, enacts preference ordering of candidates so as to eliminate the wasted vote syndrome. 
Despite this, what still wins elections, quantitatively speaking, are dedicated voting blocks, coalitional voting discipline, as in the case of PR, and especially straight ticket voters. Essentially what happens in PR is that the special interests become the political parties. So instead of the special interests bribing legislators to pass bills that exclusively favor them, which is known as lobbying, they write and pass the bills themselves, despite even open list PR. The main flaw of proportional representation is that it encourages corporatism even more than single member plurality voting already does, especially considering Diverger's Law. Legislators, as the most commonly elected agents of the state, are beholden to their campaign contributors, not their geographic constituents, except in rare cases when they are one and the same. The party who throws the most Federal Reserve notes around will always trump the plebeian civilian schmucks who happen to live in the same area. Once successfully elected, the politician in question now possesses the incumbency advantage, which is a game changer. The rule is to stay in office. The exception is to be beaten. Most popular electoral media coverage is on the executive branch, not the legislative. This is pretty startling, considering that the legislative branch was the only one that was specifically designed to be representative. It is what makes the republic of what otherwise would be a military junta, an absolute monarchy, or a communist dictatorship. Voters have more sway over legislators than the president, but they are told to focus more on something they automatically have less effect over. Even worse than this is the overemphasis on executive over legislative elections, as well as the hyped focus on federal over state level or provincial elections. The fact that a gubernatorial election is considered less newsworthy than the presidential election is alarming since your governor is infinitely more important and more accessible to you than the president ever will be. The fact that congressional elections are considered more important than the state-level legislative elections is appalling, since your state senator, for instance, affects your life more directly than some douchebag U.S. senator ever will. Minarchism is all about local government on the smallest scale possible. Many dissidents have heralded more popular democracy as the antidote for what ails the body politic. What these well-meaning souls fail to realize is that popular voting has proven to lessen our liberty, especially considering two important historical precedents. The 17th Amendment utterly gutted the purpose of the U.S. Senate as being representatives of their state legislatures to being considered as yet one more U.S. representative. This not only lessened the perceived relevance of the 50 state legislatures, but also mocked the balancing act of federalism. The subsequent gutting of the Electoral College is especially appalling. First, over half of the states in the Union are bound to the popular vote. Second, in the non-binding states, they are advisory. But in that case, why should the electors give a flying flip? They should vote according to their own criteria instead of what the uneducated democratic mob feels like doing at the moment. Notable alternative media figureheads will occasionally spout the invaluable benefits of direct democracy tools. Referenda are promoted as a run around the legislature by providing an opportunity for the hapless civilians in a local area to vote on a piece of legislation. Recalls are designed to remove a public servant from office before his term ends. The problem with both are that not only do they typically rely on petitions to get started and that during each there is the ever-present tyranny of the majority, but also that you are inherently relying on government officials to tally the votes. Curtis Ellis, the same bloke who invented the concept of democracy commandos, has made a suggestion that voting must be made compulsory. The implications of this are quite atrocious from any principled perspective. In order to have freedom, people must be forced, under threat of punishment by the state, to perform specific actions, or so Mr. Ellis would have us believe. This kind of tyrannical thinking is what brought us public school attendance, jury duty, the draft, and paying taxes. 
It is a bold mockery of the consent of the governed. If you choose to vote, you can't complain, since by voting, you were already agreeing to the election results ahead of time. This is philosophically similar to when a court arbitrates a case, in that you are agreeing to the verdict ahead of time by being involved in the trial in the first place. I prefer to not participate or otherwise sanction the begging and groveling for smaller portions of wealth that were stolen at gunpoint. It is both a matter of honesty and pride to not pretend that dangerous illusions are beneficial to human beings, when the fact of the matter is, is that they are detrimental to the human experience in every conceivable way. The American voting system has cheated, been broken, and lost the faith of considerable portions of the population, seeing that the least active mainline political process method is that of voting. Organizations such as Rock the Vote, MoveOn.org, Ron Paul's 2012 presidential campaign, and such others who have made it a point to encourage previously non-voting, or at least apolitical people to vote, are disingenuous for attempting to instill false hope in our struggle for liberty. The consistent trend of decreasing voter turnout is a positive change, and it should continue with paralleling increases of non-compliance with the establishment as a whole. For those who can't bear to not vote, the next best thing is to become a straight-ticket voter for the so-called Libertarian Party. As much as their condescending attitude at LP chapter meetings towards newcomers and overall party archy <laughs> irk me, they are the biggest third party in America, being larger than all the other fringe parties put together. Another option is to go ahead and vote, but when you're in the booth, vote for the write-in candidate. You can write in a fictional character, yourself, a fellow dissident or hapless bystander that got railroaded by the government, or, perhaps best of all, none of the above. This is essentially a vote of no confidence. Hopefully by doing this, people will understand that the entire exercise is pure pablum, and they will eventually regroup by exploring other methods that have a realistic chance for securing our liberty. You've just heard, voting does not work, originally published at the Last Bastille blog on June 1st of 2012, read to you by the author. Protesting does not work, originally published at the Last Bastille blog on April 16th of 2013, read to you by the author. A number of political dissidents consider human action to be purposeful behavior, but is it purposeful to do the same thing over and over again and yet expect a different result? Would it not make more sense to question, in good faith, the viability of certain methods? Perhaps it would behoove us to seriously reevaluate assumptions about some techniques of political activism. Having paid attention to media coverage of street demonstrations over the past decade, it would seem that there are fundamentally three different kinds or goals of street protesting. The first is a little more than being a grandstanding media whore, whereby grabbing the attention of the mainstream media spreads awareness about a particular topic, and that, by itself, it is somehow going to mystically solve the problem of whatever the protester is bellyaching over. A variation on this is the street demonstrator who deliberately commits an act of civil disobedience in a blatantly public fashion. This is done so as to increase the probability that they will be arrested by the police. The goal here is to rely on jury nullification in order to either set or reverse a judicial precedent, which will mystically, somehow, redress some other unrelated grievances. Finally, demonstrations provide a unique opportunity for dissidents to engage in a morale-raising spectacle with others who think like they do, all the while accomplishing little else. The problem with each of these kinds of street protesters is that each variation not only regularly fails in achieving its ostensible aims, but also the fact that there exist better ways to achieve whatever it is they want. There are several mechanisms accessible to us that can be used in lieu of these ineffective types of protesting, sans the cost of police brutality, including, but certainly not limited to, baton charges and kettling, or simultaneously performing at least as well 
if not dramatically better than even the very best that such street demonstrations could have accomplished idyllically. For instance, creating alternative media and culture jamming the establishment's propaganda apparatus through such methods as subvertising, pranks, and especially meme hacks, appeals to both the mind and the emotions of the public. Instead of simply annoying the living fuck out of them, ostracism of government informants, agent provocateurs, and deep cover intelligence operatives is time well spent. Instead of wasting it on constructing banners and flags that get rarely used on protest marches anyway, discreet civil disobedience allows you to live free despite the arbitrary mala prohibita commanding dictates of the state. Informally small get-togethers at individual private homes is just as morale-raising as uselessly chanting, Whose streets? Our streets! Or, This is what democracy looks like! Repeatedly in a public park like a bunch of mindless zombies. I would rather dissidents attend their local freedom festivals rather than waste their time and risk what relatively little freedom they had left by demonstrating in the street. I still chuckle whenever one of my detractors claims that I'm acting inconsistent with my own principles for publicly denouncing the viability of street demonstrations, as I've done in the past. The basic assertion is that I'm indescribably wicked, or just simply mistaken, for never even attending a protest. As I've said before, I have no intention of attending a protest of any kind about anything whatsoever. There is absolutely nothing about my political philosophy that requires me to act like a clueless hooligan. It would appear to be the case that the sycophantic followers of talk radio con artists are pushing guilt trips if you don't succumb to their emotional rhetoric about your failure to participate in useless demonstrations. Some dissidents consider street protests as a way of fighting the system. This is fallacious, for they are not actually struggling but whining about what ails the body politic. Simply complaining about Leviathan does not stop it. The withdrawal of consent, or as Ayn Rand put it, removing the sanction of the victim, coupled with defensive force, is what actually stops the march of statism. A sign-waving coward is not a warrior for his people. That's probably the worst part of protesting. The fact that it's nothing more than a proxy for real action. Instead of standing up and bravely disagreeing with the tyranny our people are suffering under, they elect to instead march through the streets as an amorphous mob, chanting manufactured slogans and waving cardboard protest signs. What cowardliness is this? They're treating it as if it were a compromise between the need to do something authentic and the fear of taking meaningful action that could actually accomplish something. According to Robert Arthur Menard, protesting is a type of acceptance giving legal permission to the government to do whatever it was they wanted to do in the first place. He suggested, in good faith, that what demonstrators ostensibly want to do is a public rejection of the regime's policies. Menard is fundamentally correct in that there are better ways of achieving the goals of activists rather than through street actions such as by writing letters to bureaucrats or filing legal documents in court. Of course, I doubt Menard understands the motivation behind the carnival of distractions, but his overall point is well taken, despite the fact that genuine sincerity is the exception, not the rule, of contemporary political activism. Speaking of the disingenuous patriot rock stars who guilt trip their listeners, that reminds me of this much-touted concept of peaceful protesting they've been pushing that I've heard about ad nauseum. Where the hell did this come from? Did everyone just forget about the Vietnam War protesters back in the 1960s who trailblazed the technique of street demonstrating itself? Peaceful protesting seems little different from the dog training that TSA performs at airports nationwide. Both are inherently designed to acclimate you into being docile and submissive to agents of the state who are the complete enemies of your liberty. Consider that Vietnam War protesters, including many of whom were returning veterans, understood that should the stormtrooper riot cops get rowdy, they still retain their natural liberty to defend themselves with, from such coercive violence with physical force. Such an attitude is currently frowned on by these patriot rock stars who are badly attempting to emulate the so-called civil rights leaders of the past half century. 
One phony rhetorical trick says that self-defense might encourage ancient provocateurs. This is, of course, the call sign of cowards, whelps, and pacifists. So-called peaceful protesting is intrinsic <laughs> it's intrinsically hypocritical and demonstrates, pun intended, no commitment whatsoever to whatever principles they claim to hold. If there were any primary differences between the demonstrators of the 60s and those throughout the 2000s, it is that the latter don't think. Be very wary of those who advocate for peaceful protesting, for they are the very same individu individuals who either do not have your best interest at heart or are simply too naive to understand what they are dealing with. Either way, you are better off disregarding their useless advice. A further distinction can be made about what the Vietnam pro uh, War protesters did do. Demonstrations can work if they are performed for several years by millions of people who are focused on a single objective, in this case, ending the Vietnam War. But activists now don't do that anymore because it's awfully passe to be actually focused on much of anything. It's sexy to be distracted by a myriad of problems rather than be seriously dedicated to a systematically pivotal goal. Who would want to actually solve problems when you can use the black block technique to bash in a window and steal an iPhone instead? It would seem to be the case that protesting now suffers from the broken window fallacy in much the same way the military industrial complex does, as is manifested by the warfare welfare state. Sometimes protests can possess the characteristics of a riot. However, what is to be gained by trashing a Starbucks window? I am certainly no fan of corporatism, but acting out a temper tantrum like a spoiled brat is not going to bring the empty suit fat cat CEOs to justice. Even worse, where is the justice in keying random cars or throwing trash and scattering other undesirable debris around the place? Did none of those phony anarchist police snitches ever consider that just in terms of probability, they are much more likely to be damaging the property of some hapless nice folks rather than trashing the cars of the actual people responsible for what they claim to be upset about? Even if they are genuine non propertarian anarchists, is it unreasonable for them to recognize that they are infringing upon the liberty of car owners by this form of intimidation? I have a sneaking suspicion that they just don't think. Street actions could also work effectively if they were done in the form of rigidly organized rallies. This is what Marcus Garvey was doing with the UNIA back in the 1920s. You want men who can march perfectly in step and who are dressed uniformly. That brings fear to the enemy. The closest this has come to actually happening was the 2012 Veterans for Ron Paul march, except for the fact that they were individually dressed. We wouldn't want a repeat of Corporal Jesse Thornton again, now would we? John Martinson has pointed out that there is such confusion about demonstrations being somehow revolutionary. As he has said, quote, I suggest thinking of what it would be like to be the evil people in power. You look out your window and see a big sign. You chuckle inwardly and then go back to plotting how you can profit from killing more people. Protests are not revolution. Holding signs and wearing t-shirts is not fighting. It's masturbation. It's whining. It's cowardly. It doesn't do anything. Signs are for armchair revolutionaries and weekend rebels. They can wave their sign, and although they know deep down that they haven't done anything at all, they can be high and mighty to their yuppie friends and say, I was there, man. During the week, they look down on their coworkers and think, I'm actually trying to make a difference. I'm doing something, unlike the rest of you groveling wage slaves. Protests mattered when people were willing to pick up guns or spears or whatever the hell was close enough to them to bludgeon the poor SOB who intended to take their life for liberty. Protests are also tactically inefficient unless you intend to use mass chaos as a cover for another operation. A protest can be readily turned into a riot and the ease by which it can be has been proven by law enforcement agent provocateurs time and time again. Then a ridiculous, futile, time-wasting crowd of thousands suddenly becomes their weapon, a tool for your oppression. They turn the protest into a riot 
and that gives them more reason to clamp down. Of course, the clamping down isn't the problem, it's the mindset. Authentic revolutionary action would mean a clamping down too, but in that case, your men aren't sign-weaving cowards and weekend revolutionaries. They know it's coming, and they will respond with deadly force. So, there will be a clamping down on them, but they are prepared for that clamping down because they are organized, because they're disciplined, because they're trained. When the mob transforms into a riot by the very people you intend to resist, they can only muster the courage to spray paint buildings and throw bricks through windows. With the illusion of safety in numbers, they might even bruise a police officer or take their aggression out on a fellow protester or passerby, as if that does anything." Close quote. I couldn't have said it better than myself. So, does protesting work? Not as it is practiced today, it doesn't. It, it, <laughs> it utterly fails to secure anyone's liberty. Worse yet, it is touted by the dissident opinion makers that if we don't do it, then you and I are somehow negligent in resisting tyrants. And what a crock of shit they are, attempting to make us feel guilty for disagreeing with their fake irrational exuberance. I say it's about damn time we took back the moral high ground from these change agents in sheep's clothing and demonstrate to them what true freedom really looks like by calling their bluff and offering alternatives to street protesting. Now might just be the time to spread the message of liberty by teaching our own people what methodologically does not work by way of public ridicule, open scorn, and widespread contempt against those who seek to divert our energies from where they need to be allocated. If we are going, indeed, to be able to tackle the establishment in any real effective way. You've just heard protesting does not work. Originally published at the Last Bestial blog on April 16th of 2013, and read to you by the author. Filming government agents does not work. Originally published at the Last Bestial blog on November 29th of 2013, read to you by the author. Police officers have bullied Americans for far too long. Their incessantly rampant abuse of our liberty is absolutely intolerable. So, the question then becomes, what can Americans do to hold these disgusting cops accountable? Reformists tend to think that working within the judicial branch of government, as well as raising public awareness of this truly horrific epidemic, are viable approaches that should be taken to protect Americans. Yet, they have failed to address any critiques to their methodology that are offered in good faith. For over the better part of a decade, it has become a frequent technique for American political dissidents to film government agents, albeit with different stylistic approaches. The first version is now known as cop blocking, which is defined as the act of filming police officers during an encounter of some kind, such as a traffic stop, with the goal of providing objective transparency for the event, especially if the situation were to degenerate violently. A variation on this are called confrontations whereby citizens initiate an encounter with a politician, usually either a legislator or a bureaucrat, with the goal of asking hardball questions in order to solicit a response they hope is demonstrative of governmental tyranny. Both approaches share the attributes of using digital consumer electronics, especially handheld video cameras, and those videos of such encounters are made publicly available by being uploaded to an internet video sharing website, such as YouTube. A commonly annoying habit of such government agents, but especially that of cops, is of claiming during such encounters that they would prefer to not be filmed, either because doing so would interfere with their investigation, or because it violates their individual privacy. Last time I checked, unless police investigations are confidential affairs performed under the auspices of secrecy, I don't understand why they would have a problem with the collection and storage of data. Although individual privacy is held as one of the most sacrosanct of personal liberties, the moment a person dons a uniform, or is otherwise representing the government in his official capacity, any reasonable expectation of privacy is forfeited so long as he operates as an agent of the state. There are trade-offs to be considered whenever statists want to assume, assume coercive power and forceful domination over their fellow man. 
Filming government agents requires a savvy knowledge of consumer electronics. The main piece of equipment is a digital video camera, whether handheld or strapped to one's body in some fashion. Prices of these consumer goods range from somewhat cheap to pretty expensive, typically $80 to $1,500. Most of these cameras rely on SanDisk SD memory cards, which range in price from $8 to $300, depending on quality and capacity. It should also be noted that there is an emerging trend towards live streaming capability, primarily because some unfortunate cop lockers have had police confiscate their SD cards. Despite the high technology currently available for sale, I can't help but wonder what the trade-offs for dissidents would be regarding their wish for government transparency relative to the privacy implications of frequently using such surveillance equipment. Put another way, does the utilization of the equipment required for filming government agents inadvertently acclimate dissidents towards regularly practicing surveillance? And if so, would this be evidence of them tacitly supporting the justifications made for the existence of the surveillance police state apparatus. As much as the technique of filming cops and politicians has been heralded by the alternative media as if it were indisputably wonderful, there has been little follow-up as, <laughs> as to how effective such a method is for providing transparency and accountability in any level of government. Unfortunately, such transparency and accountability are vaguely defined if at all, and their lack of applicability to filming government agents just comes across as nothing more than empty activist rhetoric. When you consider how such accountability is to be enforced, there are only two ways this could possibly be done with cop blocking and confrontations respectively. The number of cops being dragged into court and getting convicted, and the number of politicians who were fired or otherwise thrown out of office. In other words, how many cops have been punished and how many politicians have lost their jobs because of cop blocking and confrontations. Sadly, neither cop blocking nor confrontations have conclusively demonstrated to have held police and politicians accountable for their tyrannical actions. Wishful thinking predominates the minds of activists who are sincerely desperate for anything that might be able to prevent, mitigate, or expose the misdeeds of government. Despite this, are there two chief arguments offered by such filming advocates, one for reformism explicitly, and the other in favor of uh, public awareness? I would like to offer four different rebuttals to these two arguments in the hopes that these assertions cannot, can either be finally debunked or at least greatly challenged. The reformist argument claims that we should hold government agents accountable for their actions by documenting their atrocities for the benefit of the court so they can be convicted and punished later. My utilitarian rebuttal is that there is, is, that there is no provable track record demonstrating the effectiveness of cop blocking other than the trend of documenting the existence of the abuse itself. If the police encounter leads to a hearing or even a trial, all that the prosecutor has to do is file a motion for suppression of evidence regarding the recording in question, and if the judge grants that motion or even arbitrarily declares the evidence as somehow inadmissible, then the defendant's case is greatly handicapped, if not outright lost, because in a strict contest between a citizen's testimony versus that of a police officer's expert testimony, the cop wins hands down. With regards to politicians, the underlying assumption is that some of them can be voted out of office, which is silly to assume, because not only does it fail to address the bureaucracy, it also neglects to mention the fact that voting does not work. My deontological rebuttal is that cop blocking and confrontations both require direct physical contact with government agents. So unless you are only working within the system for some guerrilla purpose, such as whistleblowing, paper tripping, or monkey wrenching, then you are engaging in reformist tactics such as litigation. If you want nothing to do with the state, then filming government agents is contradictory to your own goals because it increases your direct contact with the government that much more than if you had not. Advocates further assert that regardless of the reformist argument, Videotaping cops and politicians is still valuable because of its propaganda value. 
so as to motivate people to become minarchists. My utilitarian rebuttal is that there is no proof demonstrating this to be true at all. In fact, there is already a plethora of police brutality videos on YouTube, as there are numerous confrontation videos. Although one could infer it might be effective in moving an individual along the other not-so-thin line, this is still wishful thinking. And for those who have had personal experience where they know for certain that these videos did help someone else begin caring about their liberty, they certainly aren't talking about it publicly. My deontological rebuttal is that if uploading videos of abusive cops and corrupt politicians were valuable as propaganda, then the whole facade of trying to hold them accountable would be broken in the minds of the viewers because the footage would very strongly suggest that you cannot hold such agents accountable at all. Considering also the historical precedent that much lesser forms of proof were sufficient for motivating vigilante justice against such government agents, as well as the fact that there is no trend of cops being frequently shot or politicians being regularly tarred and feathered before being run out of town on a rail, then this would mean, <laughs> more likely than not, that such cop blocking and confrontations utterly fail to motivate dissidents to do much of anything else other than run around and film these government agents some more. If anything, I would further suggest that such, such a profuse diet of unproductively volatile footage serves to promote fear and anger against the government without a guerrilla remedy or some other outlet for such frustration. Thus, this discontent is left to fester and eat away at your soul. I find it ironic that anarchists spearheaded the development of this method. Perhaps their motivation lay in the assumed propaganda value of trying to delegitimize the state by recording the atrocities and abuses committed by government agents. Yet with regards to reformism, and particularly to cop blocking, I question their integrity simply because if they maintain that the state does not exist, then why does something that does not exist need to be held accountable at all? As Pete Error said, quote, Having an objective record of the interaction between yourself or somebody else and police employees is crucial because if something goes down and you don't have that video, then it's a situation where it's you versus their word. And when their friends are the people judging the situation, they tend to side with those folks with badges. So the camera creates that transparent record and speaks truth. Close quote. Maybe Air doesn't understand this communications medium all that well, but this just isn't always true. Anyone who has ever played around with videography knows how easy it is to manipulate and edit footage. An abuse of this ability to do so has been argued previously by Gary Hunt in his seminal article, Because YouTube Said So. Having been on that side of the fence not that long ago, I can more deeply appreciate than most so-called activists the inherent dangers of overly relying on film as a way to secure my liberties. Although I still enjoy watching open source documentaries on boob tube, I am now much more discriminating when I analyze the claims being made in much the same manner as I study mainstream television. Another element of these confrontations and cop blocking episodes is how the cameraman will constantly interrupt the government agent and thus not allow him the opportunity to give him enough rope to hang himself with. This is very noticeable, particularly with the confrontations of politicians, and leaves the viewer either titillated with reality TV excitement or amazingly frustrated. Take the style of James O'Keefe, for instance. Regardless of your attitude towards his undercover exposés of Acorn back in 2009, what was valuable about what O'Keefe did was how he was able to elicit a response from his interviewed subjects. Although his techniques might not work well during cop blocking, it would certainly have increased the probability of success in getting any answer from politicians in those confrontation videos. In that sense, I think it is more than fair to say that James O'Keefe totally upstaged Luke Radowski, and rightfully so. 
Ironically, even though Radowski has made a name for himself in the alternative media for these so-called confrontations, he himself behaves exactly like one of those politicians whenever anyone else tries to confront him about anything. Unfortunately, cop blocking and confrontations can become a danger to your financial health, if you let it. Far from encouraging you to frugally enjoy your liberty, the hobby of filming government agents has quickly become evocative of anti-free market corporate consumerism. For example, Radowski admitted that he has a $20 shoulder harness, a GoPro camera, $200 to $400. A DSLR 60D, $500 to $1,500. An iPhone, $50 to $700, depending on series and capacity. An Android cellular telephone, $100 to $200. A $5 adapter between the iPhone and the Android phone. And an Energizer XP18000 universal AC adapter with external battery, $150. A year later, Air, Pete Air, judged Radowski's updated equipment as being terrific, especially since Radowski added to his kit a custom wireless microphone, a pair of goggles, a walkie-talkie, uh, video recording glasses, uh, this would be between $50 to $150, police scanner with earpiece, $90 to $500, and multiple unrevealed hidden cameras. I guess Radowski had to figure out a way to spend all that donation money, and it would seem to be the case that he did, even if he had to engage in the odd activist legal, defun uh, legal defense fund scam to do it. Once you understand that cops aren't even constitutional, then you begin to also understand why any notion of trying to hold them accountable by filming them seems rather, well, ineffectual. Considering also how the American prison population is by far the largest in the world in what is ironically called the land of the free, how police at all levels of government actively encourage a snitch culture, and what you should contemplate doing to protect yourself from these insatiable predators, it becomes quite clear that any notion of working within the system is just pure lunacy. Filming cops will not save you from jail. And filming politicians will not stop them from passing whatever unconstitutional statutes they damn well want. The only possible exception to this rule would be if you recorded a police officer at a traffic stop using a digital audio recorder, $30 to $80. However, make sure ahead of time that either you live in a one-party consent state uh, such as Texas, or in the case of an all-party state, make sure to get the officer's consent. Otherwise, the tape is worse than useless because you could be prosecuted if you were ever caught with that recording or if it was somehow made public. Besides this mitigation, the only realistic moves you have left is to strongly encourage these government agents to voluntarily quit their jobs while you discreetly form security teams. Never forget, but the government jobs that comprise entire police departments and judicial courts are just another welfare state handout. In conclusion, it saddens me to bear witness to how individuals have been suckered into counterproductive hobbies that unnecessarily increase their opportunity costs. This is by no means a holier-than-thou statement, for even the best of us get suckered in by the unmitigated promotion of bad techniques like this, for even Chris Cantwell goes cop-blocking. Perhaps someday, when more of us learn how to strategically plan, as well as how to objectively evaluate our tactics, then maybe liberty can indeed be secured once again from the ravaging monsters that inhabit the darkest corners of the human soul. You've just heard, Filming Government Agents Does Not Work, originally published at the Last Bestial blog on November 29th of 2013, and read to you by the author. Suing the government does not work. Lawsuits are not useful for securing your liberty. Originally published at the Last Bestial blog on July 14th of 2015, read to you by the author. Lawsuits are the judicial equivalent of ballots. If ballots are a substitute for bullets, then wouldn't that mean lawsuits are also a substitute for bullets? 
Reformists insist that if we, Americans, sue the government more often for their corrupt abuses of our common freedoms, then our liberty would become secured. I contend, instead, that reformists have not satisfied their burden of proof for demonstrating the efficacy of lawsuits in shrinking the power of the state. Reformists incompletely praise any goal of lawsuits because for them to do so would be to reveal some ugly truths about the nature of modern American democracy. Certainly, while it is true that lawsuits could, hypothetically, be used by patriots, libertarians, and other types of dissidents to hold the government somewhat accountable by constraining its power somehow, revenge against public sector employees is also an equally probable reason for suing the government. Enrichment for the plaintiff's own wallet is a less frequently admitted motive, especially considering the damage such a money-grubbing image would cast upon the reputations of various litigants. Hypothesizing about the efficacy of anything is not very useful if your a priori reasoning is less than convincing. This is largely why I prefer, when dealing with my opponents, to rely more heavily on whatever empiricism I can muster on behalf of human liberty. To that end, I will be examining a little over half a dozen lawsuits in order to determine, within the parameters of the sample, whether lawsuits are conducive to the restoration of our common freedom. Judge Alice Batchelder ruled in the American Civil Liberties Union versus National Security Agency, numbers 06-2095-2140-2007 case, that the plaintiffs lack standing to challenge the NSA's stellar wind surveillance program because they couldn't prove they were directly targeted by it. In other words, the ACLU was unable to challenge the constitutionality of the wiretapping itself because, by its very nature, stellar wind was a dragnet. According to that line of judicial reasoning, then I suppose those mobile x-ray vans roaming neighborhood streets are just as equally constitutional in their warrantless searches. Am I right? Judge John Bates ruled in the Oberwetter v. Hilliard and Salazar, number 09-0588-2010 case, that the plaintiff's lawsuit was dismissed because expressive dancing was a public demonstration, and therefore it was categorically disruptive to the tranquil and contemplative mood enforced at the Jefferson Memorial by the National Park Service. This is not an attempt by the government at chilling free expression, to paraphrase the judge, since the government is being viewpoint neutral by prohibiting all demonstrations. Apparently, it also turned out that the Jefferson Memorial is a non-public forum, which is why public demonstrations are banned. Needless to say, this didn't stop Adam Kokesh from dancing at the Jefferson Memorial on both May 28th and June 4th of 2011. Besides the property ownership issue, there is also an element here regarding the use of force, which is why I think this case uniquely angers philosophically consistent libertarians. Oberwetter was accosted by Hilliard, who ripped out her earbud, violently twisted her arm, shoved her against a pillar, and subsequently arrested her for disturbing the peace releasing her five hours later. A few days later, Hilliard issued her two citations, one for demonstrating without a permit and another for interfering with an agency function. Hilliard failed to properly prepare the matter for a court hearing and he neglected to proceed further in prosecuting Oberwetter. Why is this significant? Judge Bates ruled that Hilliard cannot be sued by Oberwetter because Oberwetter did not have the right to expressively dance within a non-public forum. Due to this, Hilliard did have probable cause to arrest Oberwetter because she was violating the administrative regulation 
against demonstrating within a non-public forum. Furthermore, Hilliard, as an officer, had the authority to use coercion during the course of an arrest in order to successfully effect it. Since there was no observable injury to Oberwetter after the fact, Hilliard's use of force was therefore not excessive. So, if a domestic abuser were to mimic the result of Hilliard's violence with a sack of oranges, considering Judge Louis Brandeis's warning in 1928 that the government teaches the whole people by its example, does that mean the battered spouse cannot seek financial recompense? Oh, wait, silly me. I assume that the state existed within the ethical boundaries the rest of humanity commonly abides by. Yet, despite the spontaneous order of the free market, I tremble to contemplate that, without any government, who would violently slam dancing women against stone pillars? Judge Sam Lindsay ordered that the Dobbs v. Farrell and Hellison, number 3, colon uh, 12 dash cv dash 5141 dash l 2013 case be dismissed with prejudice with all parties bearing their respective litigation costs Farrell forced dobbs into a traffic stop because he claimed she and her niece were littering on the highway during the stop Farrell believed he smelled the scent of cannabis within the car and after questioning dobbs he called for backup Hellison arrived on scene in order to execute warrantless cavity searches of both women, which included inserting her fingers inside both the anuses and vaginas of these women. Keep in mind, too, that Hellison used the same glove for the entirety of these searches. All of this was captured on Farrell's dash cam. The contesting parties entered into an agreed stipulation of dismissal with prejudice because they had reached an initially undisclosed settlement. Later that day after the close of the case, Scott Palmer, the Dobbs' attorney, told a CBS affiliate in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that the settlement was in the amount of $185,000 from the Texas Department of Public Safety, DPS. I guess the lesson to be learned here then is don't litter while driving through Texas because you just might get finger raped by DPS. Too bad Dobbs didn't push for a jury trial because it would have been more satisfying for me if the jury had convicted Hellison of sexual assault and Farrell of aiding and abetting, unless that would have been more appropriate for a criminal case. Speaking of settlements, such was also the result in Eckert versus Hidalgo and Deming number 1 colon 13 dash CV dash 00727 um, 2014 case. Eckert was forced into a traffic stop and during the course of it the cops lied by claiming that Eckert was hiding illicit narcotics within his anus. Eckert was subsequently arrested and then taken to Gila Regional Medical Center where he was forcibly anally probed repeatedly. This entailed two x-rays, three enemas, and a surgical colonoscopy. Ultimately, Eckerd settled for $1,600,000 from both Hidalgo County and the city of Deming. Interestingly enough, the settlement mentioned that Eckerd must bear the cost of his own legal counsel and is also liable for paying federal income tax. This raises a rather interesting question. Are settlements or even damages tax exempt from federal income tax liability? If not, then that would suggest the abused citizen gets raped twice, first by the rape itself and secondly by way of taxation. Judge Edward Lodge ordered in the Miller versus City of Post Falls number 2 colon 13 dash CV dash 00517 EJL uh, 2014 case that the lawsuit be dismissed with prejudice because the parties had reached an undisclosed settlement. According to the complaint, Miller was raided in the middle of the night by the Post Falls Police Department. Officer Urig ran up to her home, bursted 
through the front door and informed Miller he was going to search her house. Despite her objection, he grabbed her arm, twisted it up behind her back, kneed her in the middle of her back, and then handcuffed her while telling her to stop resisting. Next, Urig drew his gun and searched the house while repeatedly yelling, Post Falls Police Department! and Crow! despite the hysterical shrieking of children in the home. Request to the officers on scene to shut the door because of the 23 degree outside weather or to be quieter because of the sleeping infant baby went unheeded. Miller was placed under arrest for growing cannabis and the rest of the household were either placed into productive custody or were otherwise evicted from the premises. Miller was released approximately 48 hours later. Six months later, a court hearing was set on the grounds that she was charged with simple possession of cannabis. Yet the court ended up suppressing all evidence because the government police had made an unlawful entry. As part of her lawsuit, Miller was ordered by the court to submit to a defense psychological exam. Following the undisclosed results of that exam, the parties reached and a similarly undisclosed settlement. It's awfully too bad that neither the corporate nor the alternative media were able to discover the settlement amount. Uniquely, a jury found in the Genovese versus Town of Southampton, number 10-CV-34702014 case, number 10-CV-34702014 case, that malicious prosecution had occurred. Nancy Genovese was detained for over five hours at the side of the road because she was photographing a displayed helicopter shell at a National Guard base. Genovese's legally stored rifle was seized from her car, and she was threatened with being charged as a terrorist in order to specifically intimidate other Tea Partiers. Also, defamatory statements were made about her by the government police to the mainstream press. According to the complaint, the cops also stole $5,300 from Genovese's wallet. She was forced to disrobe in front of one of them while getting a medical examination, and they eventually put her on suicide watch, which required her to wear a suicide gown. This is essentially what mental patients in a padded room wear. Despite her continued pleas for a clean gown once it had become soiled over the course of several days of being forcibly bound, these pleas went unheeded. Thankfully, the jury verdict found Deputy Robert Carlock guilty of malicious prosecution. Yet, for whatever reason, they also thought that Genovese had failed to prove either battery or political oppression. The jury only awarded Genovese $1,112,000 for comp compensatory damages but nothing for punitive damages against Carlock, simply because they could not reach a unanimous decision. Judge Jeffrey White ruled in the Jewell v. NSA number 08-04373-2015 case earlier this year that plaintiffs had failed to establish a sufficient factual basis that they had standing to sue under the Fourth Amendment regarding the possible interception of their internet communications. Former AT&T technician Mark Klein's testimony was useless because he could not determine the content, function, or purpose of room 641A as a black room within the SBC Communications Building in San Francisco. Again, plaintiff's case was dismissed since they were unable to challenge the constitutionality of the wiretapping because it was a dragnet, just like eight years previously. Tabulating these cases briefly, I think, will concisely reveal some much-needed truths regarding the effectiveness of suing the government. Assuming that settlements are draws, awarded damages are wins, and dismissals with prejudice are losses, then the results of the aforementioned data set are as follows. ACLU, lost. Oberwetter, lost. Dobbs, draw. Eckert, draw. Miller, draw. Genovese, 
one joule lost. Out of this sample of seven cases, in terms of percentages, this means that only 14% of these cases uh, were clearly won, and that 42% of these cases ended equally in either a loss or a draw. Even if I inflate the success ratio by considering draws the same as wins, then still only 57% of these cases ended in some sort of monetary awards, which could be considered a viable goal for the plaintiffs if the goal was simply financial recompense and not necessarily any serious attempt to rein in government power. What does all of this actually mean, though? First, let's take a look at the seldom mentioned Seventh Amendment. Quote, In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed twenty dollars, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined at any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. Close quote. Obviously, it's a little hard for plaintiffs to exercise the Seventh Amendment with the federal judiciary if they end up, quite literally, settling nearly all of the time, pun intended, as Angel Dobbs, David Eckert, and Melissa Miller did. I fail to see how settling with the King's Guards reins in the absolute power of the state. Secondly, consider the following YouTube comments by a user, Dodgeman7909, who criticized Larkin Rose for being a self-defense advocate. As a note, grammar has not been changed. Quote, Now, I am a police officer, but I'll be the first to tell you that there are some bad cops out there, but an overwhelming majority of us are good. I believe in the Constitution and everybody's rights. I'm against gun bans and very restricting laws. If you are too, then state it and try to change it. Not by saying shoot police, because that is the dumbest thing anyone could say. If you feel you are mistreated or denied your rights, file a lawsuit or whatever. But putting a video like this out there is ridiculous. If I had someone who tried to shoot me because they didn't believe in government or whatever, it will not end well for them because my main goal every day I go to work is to go home when I get off and I'll do anything to make that happen. And you, Larkin Rose, are an extremist. Close quote. If indeed this Dodge Man is part of the gendarmerie, and a good one to boot, then the only remaining question would be is that, is he the exception or the rule when it comes to good unconstitutional policing? Notice also the quick use of the term extremist. Doesn't that mimic the political oppression of Nancy Genovese? Unjust profiling much? Let's also consider some other factors that reformists who advocate for suing the pants off of the government frequently ignore. Policemen and judges enjoy qualified immunity and judicial immunity, respectively. Contrasting this with the statements of Dodge Man suggests that you must rely on the government's own rules to hold itself accountable, even if the judge ends up dismissing the case later, quite possibly with negative repercussions toward yourself, if he deems the case frivolous or worse, declares you to be a vexatious litigant for even taking your case to court in the first place. If we are to learn from the government's own example, then several more revelations present themselves for our remedial political education. Essentially, you have to wait around until the government hurts you, personally. Should you receive a settlement or damages, the government will pay you using taxpayer money or otherwise from some other source of wealth that it can easily replenish because of its taxing authority. At most, the state is only embarrassed by the notoriety caused by a lawsuit in the corporate media, not the substance of the lawsuit itself. If what happened to a plaintiff is horrendous enough, the government will be more than happy to offer a sacrifice in order to distance its legitimacy away from your case, usually under the auspices of this is just an isolated incident, as what happened in the Dobbs case with the firing of Hellison. One reason to maintain as good health as possible 
is that once you are arrested as a political prisoner, then you are denied medical attention you ask for, and whatever medical attention they force upon you is always used against you somehow, uh, as in the Eckert and Genovese cases. The repeated theme in these, law in these lawsuits of narcotics prohibition, uh, especially of cannabis, as in the Dobbs and Miller lawsuits, wouldn't be tolerated for a moment in a truly free society. The efficacy of lawsuits is approaching that of jury nullification, quite frankly, and not just in the sense of uselessly waiting around, but also the fact that you are still reliant upon the bar attorneys to make the opportunity for these techniques to manifest themselves in the first place. There is absolutely no semblance of trying to escape from the system here, but rather an attempt to change the system from within by not only embarrassing it, but also making it pay using other people's money, namely the taxpayers. I have not seen one civil case where a government cop was forced to perform restitution to his victim from his own pockets. Socializing losses much? Opportunity costs abound in lawsuits against the government. Civil lawsuits usually take months or even years. The Genovese case took four and a half years. Imagine the emotional stress involved while the case is being adjudicated over that period of time. Should you win, consider also the opportunity costs incurred when you are doing things like reading law, talking to your lawyer, and waiting around in courtrooms. These occur even if you do win and receive money from the government, because that's time and effort you can't ever get back. Worst of all, suing the government reinforces the legitimacy of the state itself. Lawsuits legitimize the coercive monopoly that is the judiciary. Reformists prefer other people to incur opportunity costs by learning all the rules of civil procedure instead of focusing on developing free market alternatives to replace the judiciary. To add insult to injury, nearly all the cases I presented, except for the ACLU, Oberwetter, and Jewell cases, inherently rely on the 14th Amendment's nefarious incorporation doctrine. Every single time a reformist suggests that a Title 42 civil lawsuit should be filed against an entity from one of the several state governments, they are invoking the forceful application of the United States Constitution against the several state constitutions by way of the 14th Amendment. Title 42, United States Code, Section 1983 says, in part, that, quote, Every person who, under color of any statute, ordinance, custom, or usage, of any state or territory or the District of Columbia, subjects and causes to be subjected, any citizen of the United States, or other person within the jurisdiction thereof, to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution and laws shall be liable to the party injured in an action at law, suit in equity, or other proper proceeding for redress, except that in any action brought against a judicial officer for an act or omission taken in such officer's judicial capacity, injunctive relief shall not be granted unless a declaratory decree was violated or declaratory relief was unavailable." Close quote. To be within the jurisdiction thereof might as well be subject to the jurisdiction thereof, as far as I can figure it, unless there is a legalistic distinction between the word within and the words subject to. You can never tell with lawyers how they are going to mangle the plain English language this week. In other words, reformists are morons who willfully neglect to read law. The only real exception to my hypothesis that suing the government does not work is that if what the government did to you was particularly egregious and they impoverished you in the process, then a civil lawsuit might be your only plausible recourse towards getting your life back on track. But again, this is at best just a rear guard action, much like jury nullification, where the goal is to simply recoup your losses so you are not completely destitute. But it is certainly not a method you want to rely on as part of some overall strategy to secure your liberty. Again, the best case scenario I can perceive is that the settlement or damages awarded to you 
make you potentially liable for paying federal income taxes, presumably because the IRS assumes the monies are equivalent of windfall profits, and in that sense are much like a capital gains tax. In other words, the government still wins, thereby making successful grassroots lawsuits more of a pyrrhic victory than anything else. Sometimes when you win, you still end up losing simply because it's not a tactical victory, since at the end of the day, you don't come out ahead of the government in any real way, much less any sort of decisive or even strategic victories, that is, real victories. Once you comprehend the truth that the law is a racket, then you begin to understand why really any sort of legalistic solution, unless it helps you escape or avoid the state, is truly little else other than a notorious reformist project of some kind. If the most successful result I can find from lawsuits against the government for committing explicit political oppression resulted in only compens compensatory damages after over four years in litigation, then I think any hope of suing for freedom, much like the freedom suits of old, should be given up entirely. The fact of the matter is that America is a police state, and anybody wasting time in a government monopoly courtroom attempting to hold statists accountable is just as naive or delusional as cop blockers at this point. If for whatever reason anyone wants to bother with suing government agents, might I suggest exploring your state government's laws for doing so? such as the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code. At least that way, you won't be invoking the 14th Amendment, and therefore it would be consistent with the legal concept of state citizenship. And for goodness sakes, fund your own legal misadventures instead of trying to socialize it onto others through activist legal defense fund scams. When it comes to the efficacy of suing the government, I think what I have discovered here just reinforces to me that Gustave de Molinari really was correct about the privatization of security services, especially considering that these rampant abuses committed by government, government police would never be tolerated by the customers of privately produced security because they would be able to boycott those corrupt producers right into bankruptcy, and rightfully so. In summation, when a reformist is grandstanding that you aren't being patriotic enough or in accordance with libertarian principles if you fail to file a lawsuit, tell them, politely, to just bugger off. These nincompoops have failed to bear their burden of proof that lawsuits systematically work to restore or otherwise secure one's liberty. Maybe if they spend half of their advocacy time on using the economic means of making money, then perhaps they would realize that the political means of making money only leads us down the road to perdition. Postscript. I'd like to thank Tennessee Rose for her invaluable assistance in getting the court documents that are now currently hosted and available for free download on libertyunderattack.com, for without her, this article would have been impossible. You've just heard, suing the government does not work. Lawsuits are not useful for securing your liberty originally published at the Last Bestial blog on July 14th of 2015, and read to you by the author. The Activist Legal Defense Fund Scam, originally published at the Last Bestial blog on September 2nd of 2013, read to you by the author. April 7th, 2015 update. A reader of mine has brought to my attention the fact that I had neglected to mention the technological problems inherent in the transparency of several crowdfunding websites. Also, I have decided to expand upon Jim Hogshire's advice on having an arrest plan in light of predictably recurring events. So in response, I have added two paragraphs addressing those concerns. The rest of this article has remained unchanged. During times of oppression, it is not at all uncommon for absolute governments to arbitrarily imprison their own people, especially those who are politically incorrect. Although such governments may not be able to openly persecute these political prisoners, they are more than happy to play the gotcha game by trying to arrest those individuals who 
violate mala prohibita, or sometimes they'll just go ahead and frame them for it. Today, America, the purported land of the free, enjoys the unique distinction of maintaining the largest prison population on the entire planet. A trend I've noticed over the years is for both patriots and libertarians to elicit sympathy from their respective audiences by requesting them to support an incarcerated person whom they claim is being targeted by the government. All sorts of noise gets made, especially over digital social media websites like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, covering the details about the purported injustice being committed. At the end of the day, though, what was actually accomplished by all the yammering, ranting, and pontificating regarding the latest cage dissident? One common aphorism promulgated by activists who insist that others must join in their effort to provide legal defense support for a fellow jailed dissident is by asserting that through creating awareness in the mainstream media about a specific prisoner, then any sort of injustice flowing from the bench would be automatically tempered by the glaring lens of the corporate media. This is fallaciously wrong on multiple counts. First, writing a letter to the editor on the prisoner's behalf is ill-conceived because writing letters to the editor about any topic at all simply does not work. Second, spreading hyperlinks to articles detailing the ongoing saga to your associates and various email lists is ineffective because how do you expect those who happen to read them to act on the information? Third, volunteering any labor, such as by writing letters to the prisoner himself, or even going so far as to attend his trial, is utterly fruitless. There is nothing you can tell the inmate that the prison guards would not, al would not also know, and unless you are testifying in court on the defendant's behalf, there is no benefit you can provide for him by simply acting as a spectator in the courtroom. What about donating your hard-earned monopoly money for the goal of helping the prisoner regain his freedom? Now we are starting to get at the heart of the matter, for awareness by itself does not pay the bills, as it were. Legal defense funds are all the rage in activist circles, for they seem to be a concrete way of supporting a prisoner's ability to legally defend himself in court from the government's charges. The key question in that nearly all the advocates of such legal defense funds desperately attempt to avoid is, how are the funds being allocated exactly? It is problematic regardless of whether the funds are sent to a third party organization managing the fund or are directly handled by the accused. Let us first see if it is possible to determine what precisely would need to be paid out of a legal defense fund. It is not unreasonable to assume the highest priority for any legal defense fund to pay for would be a privately hired defense attorney who is assumed to be noticeably better at defending clients than the public defenders are, unless you believe Jim Hogshire, in which case this potential reason can be safely ruled out. Other reasons would include hiring freelance investigative reporters or private detectives to work undercover by trying to determine whether or not government corruption would be at play, for if it were, then the public revelation of such malfeasance would positively demonstrate that the prisoner's due process was being violated, which might be more than enough reason for all the charges against him to be dropped. The chief goal of any legal defense fund is to hire a team of specialists who can increase the probability of either getting the defendant found innocent in court or forcing the government's charges to be dropped completely. If no attorney, investigative reporter, private detective, or any other kind of legal professional is not having their services retained by a legal defense fund, then it does beg the question as to what those funds are being allocated towards instead. Should a defendant continue to use his court-appointed public defender would it then be unreasonable for us to assume that any donations to such a fund are not being allocated towards any kind of legal defense, despite the fact that the prisoner in question is still asking sympathetic strangers for donations to his legal defense fund? Is it really that strange under these circumstances to assume that all public requests for donations to any such legal defense funds are in reality 
just scams. Luke Rakowski, the figurehead for We Are Change, Inc., solicited for donations intended for a legal defense fund during March of 2009 on behalf of himself and two other We Are Change members and retained all the contributions after the charges that warranted the legal defense fund were dropped. Case details provided by the New York State Unified Court System show that Rudkowski retained the services of, of the Legal Aid Society, specifically the New York County Criminal Defense Office located on 49 Thomas Street in Manhattan, whose own mission statement says that the society is a, quote, not-for-profit legal services organization, close quote. Rudkowski was able to raise $4,241.55 through an online chip-in fundraiser. Although none of these funds have been accounted for as required by the We Are Change Code of Conduct, as such, there is no reason to believe that any of these funds ever made it to the Legal Aid Society or even should have been collected in the first place. Adam Kokesh, following the events of his arrest at Smokedown Prohibition 5 on May 18th of 2013, was interviewed by We Are Change, Inc. on May 30th. He asserted that the reason the government dropped their case against him, but not against N.A. Poe for exactly the same thing, which was a felony charge for ostensibly violating Title 18 United States Code Section 111, was because of his popularity on the Internet. He went on to thank George Donnelly for managing his legal defense fund, a service Kokesh described as part of his arrest insurance that he purchased from Donnelly since Kokesh was a client of Shield Mutual. Kokesh also suggested that the reason N.A. Poe got railroaded by the government and thus is still in legal limbo was because he capitulated to working within the system by paying bail and so forth. Thus, according to Kokesh, all of us need to resist more, which will then force the government to back off because the cost of enforcement would become too high for them. Worst of all, Luke Rudkowski also recommended during this interview that in order to be true to yourself, you must relinquish whatever privacy you have left and become a self-made public figure, lest you make yourself vulnerable to government persecution by suffering the same fate as Brandon Raub. George Donnelly, who upon hearing that Kokesh was not going to hire a defense attorney, published an article on June 5th announcing that Shield Mutual will be offering refunds to any donators who asked for one, just as long as they do so before the two-week deadline ended on June 19th. He had raised $5,377.44 for Kokesh's legal defense fund by this point. Kokesh was subsequently arrested again, this time on June 8th, at the Smokedown Prohibition Joint Summit with President Choom in Washington, D.C., and then yet again on July 9th, when his home was invaded at night by both Herndon and U.S. Park Police. Donnelly published another article on July 17th, providing screenshots of the accounting he was tasked with keeping. According to this article, the amount of refunded donations, plus the payment processor's fees, came to $465.83, which left a balance of $4,911.61 in the legal defense fund as of June 21st. This amount was sent by Donnelly to Lucas Jewell, who was Kokesh's business manager for Adam vs. the Man, AVTM, at the time, in the form of a check that same day on June 21st. Also, both the Bitcoin and Litecoin donations were released simultaneously as well, in the amounts of 4.500.2619 Bitcoin and 120 and a half Litecoin. The conversions work out to approximately $450 and $284, respectively, for a current running total of $5,646.41. Mr. Jewell contacted Donnelly on June 26, July 2nd, and July 5th, claiming each time that the check for $4,911.61 had not been received yet. Meanwhile, presumably acting in the best interests of his client, Donnelly requested donations on July 10th for Kokesh's legal defense fund regarding his July 9th arrest and raised nearly $1,400 for three press releases, 
the first one of which cost him $369 out of Shield Mutual's own petty cash. The current running total at this point for the Legal Defense Fund was $6,300.58. On July 15th, Donnelly discovered that the payment processor had stopped the payment. Apparently, the United States Postal Service claimed on July 12th that the check was undeliverable. That same day, Donnelly issued a new check for $5,431.58 to Jeffrey Phillips, who is Kokesh's new AVTM business manager, which was $519.97 more than the previous check's amount because Donnelly wanted reimbursement for the first press release he had already issued. Also on July 15th, Donnelly gave a loan of $500 to Daryl Young, who is another AVTM staff member, for the express purpose of expediting Kokesh's bail payment. Later that same day, Mr. Phillips canceled the legal defense fund. Donnelly also claimed in his July 17th article that $172 had been raised already, but that those donations would be refunded since Kokesh decided to use a public defender anyway. The five-man AVTM business team composed of Daryl Young, Jeffrey Phillips, Ed Yaley, Liz Delcano, and Jeremy Mazur issued a fundraising statement on July 16th, which was read by Ms. Delcano. Quote, first of all, Adam versus the man is no longer affiliated with Shield Mutual for any fundraising efforts. Please direct all of your donations to Adam versus the man's page, and you can reach the invest link at URL. At that site, you will be able to donate Bitcoin, Litecoin, and medals, as well as Federal Reserve notes, because we wish to support alternate economies. If you have any questions whatsoever about your donation, please contact me at email. Tomorrow, we'll be having a money bomb fundraiser in order to muster up the funds we'll need to stabilize and keep going at full speed. The donations we gather will be used for legal and operational expenses at Adam's discretion. Ah, oh, isn't that rather interesting? So, AVTM admits that, despite Kokesh's earlier statements on May 30th in praise of George Donnelly's management of the Legal Defense Fund, he is still being thrown under the bus for no good reason whatsoever, as I have just outlined. AVTM then issued another press release on July 18th, where this time they try to further justify the dropping of Shield Mutual. Quote, As of July 15, 2013, we are no longer using Shield Mutual for any of their services. The reason behind this decision is based upon funds that George Donnelly raised on May 18, 2013. These were never released to Adam and are still missing. In light of these events, we have directed all fundraising efforts through channels that the Adam vs. the Man team can monitor and utilize most effectively in order to quickly and accurately enact Adam's request from the detention center. This fundraising approach allows Adam the most control over his assets while he is unlawfully incarcerated. Adam will not be using the public defender and therefore needs to raise at least $10,000 in order to obtain appropriate counsel." Close quote. No mention was made of the hiccup with the USPS, which was not Donnelly's fault. The check Donnelly issued to Mr. Phillips for $5,431.58, or the $500 loan to Mr. Young. So the claim made by the AVTM business team that the funds are somehow still missing is brought into serious doubt. <laughs> Not only that, but the AVTM business team now wants to handle any legal defense donations themselves to the tune of $10,000 plus, all the while claiming that Kokesh did not want to use his public defender, which directly contradicts what Donnelly said the day before on July 17th. So, the real question here is, did Jeffrey Phillips, in fact, receive the check for $5,431.58 and Daryl Young the $500 loan for a grand total of $5,931.58 from George Donnelly? And did Kokesh choose to retain his public defender or not? 
Kokesh admitted in an earlier July 8th, 2013 interview on The Alex Jones Show, which was the day before his home was invaded and he was arrested yet again, that since his open carry march into D.C. lacked the critical mass of individuals he wanted, coupled with his arrest on May 18th in Philadelphia during Smoke Down Prohibition 5, it would not be wise for him to continue organizing an event that required marchers to cross a political border armed. This formed the basis for why he changed his mind from organizing a single armed march into D.C. on July 4th to instead propose to his audience that they should hold their own protest demonstrations at their respective state capitals. Despite this, Kokesh also said during this interview that he still wants to do the exact same march next year on Independence Day of 2014. Needless to say, that just might be impossible for him to pull off if he is convicted of the various drug and gun felony charges that is the government's justification for his July 9th arrest. Regardless of whether he is convicted, I have no doubt his AVTM business team will, in the meantime, rake in a handsome profit. Unlike Adam Kokesh, N.A. Poe did provide at least a partial accounting for his legal defense fund. As you can no doubt tell from his fundly.com page, Mr. Poe was able to raise $3,370 from 124 donators whose statistical mode donation was $10 per donator. Unfortunately, there is absolutely no proof currently available to demonstrate what exactly Mr. Poe spent that money on. This is especially disconcerting when combined with the fact that despite my offer to him to get his story out, he has steadfastly refused to provide me with the legal documents of his case. This deeply concerns me further since he already admitted to me that the feds have attempted to turn him into an informant at least a few times now. Charles Dyer was a former U.S. Marine who became a vlogger and public speaker at Tea Party, of, Tea Party events. Jay Croft probably describes him the best. Quote, Charles Dyer, otherwise known as the July 4 Patriot, a.k.a. J4P, one of the greatest spokesmen of the real Patriot movement, got hooked by a vindictive ex-wife, a corrupt podunk Oklahoma town, and the FBI. It took three jury trials, but it took bogus child molestation charges, as well as his shyster court officer lawyer who sold him out, that got him convicted. He's serving 30 years, but I believe it was for his peaceable patriot activism. Close quote. In the context of what he thinks is an example of failed legal defense support, Jay Croft elaborates, quote, Charles Dyer was a Marine who spoke out during the Bush years, got in trouble for it, went to trial three times over regarding a bogus airsoft copy of a grenade launcher and totally made up child molestation charges, the last of which they won by making him flee for his life when his home and all his exculpatory evidence was burned in an act of arson, and the judge only gave him a week delay as his trial was going to start the next Monday from when the incident occurred. He fled, was sold out by his contacts, and was caught shirtless in Texas trying to get a drink at a restaurant. Dyer's final trial was basically one day, held mostly in the judge's chambers, and then he was sent to prison for 30 years. This author attempted repeatedly to rally support for Dyer, but was stymied at every turn by co-intel operators like Mama Liberty, and probably worse, endemic indifference. Close quote. But is that the totality of what really happened to Charles Dyer? Was this really just a simple case of endemic indifference, as J. Croft put it, or is there more to the story? As it turns out, there is quite a bit more than J. Croft's overly simplified, albeit well-intentioned, explanation of Dyer's legal saga. Deborah Swan established the Dollars for Dyer Legal Defense Fund in September of 2011. After Ms. Swan had collected only $50 in donations, Rick Light committed libel when he asserted that she stole $10,000 from the fund, as well as claiming that Jan Dyer, Charles's mother, never had access to the funds raised or was even aware of it. This is also the very same Rick Light who has been consorting with employees or agents of the government, especially the FBI with regard to the Charles Dyer affair. 
Concurrently, a totally separate legal defense fund was established on Chip-In by Patriot Unity Coalition member organization Patriot Legal Defense that has since become defunct, which was run by Nancy Genovese, aka Mystic Star, who is the very same individual who single-handedly bankrolled New Colony Media during my short-lived stint with them. No accounting of any donated funds was ever made publicly available by Genovese, Genovese's Patriot Legal Defense organization. Similar to Rick Light's libel against Ms. Swan, Randy Mack was slandered by Jim Stack, who asserted that not only had Randy tried to destroy J4P's donations, but also that Randy had accused Jim himself of having the means to access the PayPal account through which Jim supposedly stole an undefined amount of donations. Of course, since it has already been established that there were at least two completely separate legal defense funds for Charles Dyer, it is still unclear which fund Jim was referring to in his slander against Randy. When Chris Mortensen, a former U.S. Marine, hired the U.S. Observer to perform some investigative reporting about Charles Dyer's legal troubles, Ed Snook breached his contract by simultaneously contracting with Jan Dyer and Amy Dark, Charles' sister, for the exact same work to the tune of $6,500 and $3,000, respectively, as well as committing libel and slander against not only Mr. Mortensen, but also Ms. Swan, the latter of whom actually signed the contract on Mortensen's behalf since he was simply bankrolling Snooks' assignment to the tune of a $10,000 retainer for a grand total of $19,500 that the U.S. Observer was paid. Granted, while there was no formal legal defense fund involved here, one of the key purposes, as I stated earlier, for why you have such a fund in the first place is to hire legal professionals, like Mr. Snook, to get the defendant off the hook. I don't think it is too much of a stretch to assume that all the money paid out by Mr. Mortensen, Mrs. Dyer, and Mrs. Dark for the express purpose of vindicating Charles Dyer would be in reality fundamentally different from what any legal defense fund is supposed to accomplish. And at the very least, it still qualifies as legal defense support. Any investigative expose about Charles Dyer's legal troubles shouldn't have to cost almost two, uh, excuse me, almost 20 thousand dollars to write up. Examining the legal defense funds and support work involving Luke Rutowski, Adam Kokesh, and Charles Dyer reveals some pretty ugly facts. First, there is no way of measuring how effective spreading awareness about some random dissident's legal troubles actually is. Second, non-monetary legal defense support, such as writing letters to the editor or attending court hearings, are worse than useless because they are counterproductive methods that necessarily increase opportunity costs. Third, private defense attorneys are almost never actually hired, even though this is the primary reason for a legal defense fund in the first place. Fourth, any accounting of the donations is rarely ever provided, either privately to each of the donators or publicly. If anyone should demand financial transparency, as was the case with some of the We Are Change members like Louis B., or themselves release the transaction records, as was the case with George Donnelly, they are harshly demonized by those individuals and circled wagon crews who seek to benefit from the naivete of well-meaning donators, or alternatively, the circled wagon crews will attempt to deflect attention from themselves by falsely accusing other individuals of stealing from the legal defense funds as what happened to Deborah Swan and Randy Mack. This naivete does not come cheap, as it has cost donators, cumulatively from the three case studies already covered, to the tune of at least $29,673.13. Granted, this pales in comparison to Ron Paul's phony 2012 presidential electoral bid, which is estimated to be a whopping $40 million dollars, but I digress. What can be done about this, if anything? Let us consult Jay Croft again. Quote, Common gangbangers can count on support for their trial and while in prison. When they get out of prison, 
they are not out on their ass. That the patriot movement could learn from street thugs is by itself testament enough to how ineffective the movement has been led to be. It's a testament to how the movement has been left in the hands of celebrity gatekeepers who effectively neutralize it for the enemy. Close quote. In other words, political dissidents suffer from less camaraderie than even street, ga <laughs> than even street gangs do. As such, when your time comes, you will experience it totally and completely alone, whether it be a brief roadside detention, a longer-term incarceration, or even the more, at least absent a security team anyway. Should you and I take the not-so-subtle hint that the teasing the bear variety of civil disobedience does not work either? Might it be preferable to instead practice discreet civil disobedience like Samuel Edward Conklin III advocated? But what if you feel that you must donate? In that case, I would most strongly suggest that you perform your own due diligence and ask the legal defense fund managers whether they have retained the services of an attorney or not. If they haven't found one yet because they are still considering whom they'd like to represent the defendant, then that should be an automatic red flag for you. In that case, I think you should react by delaying on donating anything until such time an attorney is retained, if it happens at all. If you have learned instead that the defendant has decided to use his public defender or chosen to represent himself, then the need to donate to a legal defense fund is rendered moot. If the lawyer has been retained, but you are uncomfortable with donating money to the legal defense fund because of the fund's manager, for instance, then I would advise you to pay the lawyer directly, if at all possible. Holding a money bomb fundraiser vis-a-vis -vis a crowdfunding website on behalf of the accused does not solve the above-mentioned problems with the systematic lack of transparency either. Whether it be sites like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or Patreon, the trend appears to be, generally speaking, against showing what those donations were spent on, as was the case with N.A. Poe mentioned earlier. Until such time those expenses are shared publicly in emulation of George Donnelly, or at least made available to the donators themselves, I wouldn't put much faith in the reliability of any of the so-called legal defense fund managers to be responsible with the collected monies. Regardless of which option you take, do it for the right reasons. Don't do it because you've been guilt-tripped by the empty rhetoric emanating from the mouth of some manipulative talking head. You are not a bad person, and your ideals are not rendered somehow insincere because you didn't bend over and immediately donate money to a random legal defense fund for someone you either don't know or have reservations about. On the other hand, if you avoid performing your own due diligence and just flippantly donate to a legal defense fund because some self-important internet political pundit with delusions of grandeur demanded you to do so, then you have nobody to blame but yourself. In that case, you chose to assume full and total responsibility for your actions by being willing to literally gamble your money on whether the legal defense fund managers have the integrity to allocate the funds for what they advertise they be used for, instead of being diverted under false pretenses to someone's personal kitty fund. There is, of course, a much simpler, yet absolutist, route you could take. Just simply ignore any and all public requests for donations to legal defense funds carte blanche. Save your money and use it for whatever you would have otherwise have donated towards something that can actually help you secure your liberty, like buying a carton of bullets, for instance. Don't just stop there, though. I further recommend you don't waste your time and effort rampantly consuming all the nitty-gritty details about some random liberty activist who got arrested by the government during this week's news cycle, like, uh, like I have in the past, as demonstrated by the three copiously detailed aforementioned case studies about Rutkowski, Kokesh, and Dyer. There is virtually nothing to be learned from their escapades other than what not to do. If you sincerely want to learn about what you should do, I recommend you do yourself a favor and lower your opportunity costs by reading You Are Going to Prison and applying Jim Hogshire's advice as you need it. The old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, is never more true than when you are evading 
or are attempting to survive the beast that is the criminal that is the American criminal injustice system. Just as survivalists have bug out plans, I believe it is imperative for all American political dissidents from across the entire ideological spectrum to devise what the cop lockers have described as an arrest plan. Namely, it would be prudent to make arrangements before you experience a police interrogation to have any dependents of yours squirreled away with someone trustworthy, to inform a single point of contact that you are being held by government police, and to shower and shave for your mugshot, if at all possible, regardless of whether the scenario is a roadside traffic stop or a midnight home raid. Of course, you could negate any purported need for legal defense funds if you approach your legal troubles from the perspective of a state citizen, such as by acting as a pro se litigant, having someone you trust act as next friend, or filing a habeas corpus ad subjuciendum to challenge the legality of your incarceration. Then legal defense funds become moot, unless you seriously want to beg perfect strangers to foot the bill for your own court costs. Similarly, if you've allocated some of your savings ahead of time towards future commissary purchases, then any excuses to jimmy up requests for donations gets reduced down to zero. I guess the biggest problem I have with the whole notion of volunteering my personal time to provide legal defense support, or worse, donating my hard-earned monopoly money to a shady legal defense fund, is that the entire concept is predicated on the assumption that if we support the prisoner's attempt to legally work within the system, then that is the only realistic chance he has for regaining his freedom. The unsaid justification behind legal support work with or without a concomitant defense fund is inherently reformist. It relies on the beast's own rules to escape the clutches of the beast itself. And such rules intrinsically violate any notion of due process, procedural or substantive. Besides, do you want to be responsible for justifying the existence and actions of the American Bar Association through your funding of its attorneys? In summation, giving free legal defense support or donating to a legal defense fund is a recipe for failure. Consider also that the oh-so-valuable bar attorney is bound by the rules of the court, which unfairly favors the administrative agencies anyway. If you don't believe me, then read Justice Brandeis' concurring opinion in Ashwander v. TVA. Generally speaking, it costs a minimum of $20,000 to legally contest criminal charges success uh, successfully. And the ones who stand to gain the most from it, aside from the scumbag bar attorneys, are the notorious patriots for profit. They nickel and dime their audiences for such lesser stuff, and thus bleed them dry slowly over time. All they want are Federal Reserve notes. Have you noticed that they never seem to accomplish anything substantive, much like how the American Cancer Society claims to want to cure cancer? The whole idea of legal defense support is literally stupid, both deontologically as well as in a utilitarian sense. The presumption it has of leave no one behind is bullshit, plain and simple. An individual soldier is expendable since it would be a waste of effort to try and rescue him, either through proving his innocence in court or by way of an operationally planned and executed prison break. Sadly, the truth of the matter is that nobody is coming to save you from the gulag when your time comes. So, act accordingly. You've just heard the Activist Legal Defense Fund Scam originally published at the Last Bastille blog on September 2nd of 2013, and read to you by the author. Reformism does not work. A critique of political activism, originally published at the Last Bastille blog on July 16th of 2015, read to you by the author. They tell us, sir, that we are weak unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be the next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the 
elusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot. Patrick Henry. As I've written before, sound strategy rests on the rational synergy between ends and means, diminishing the possibility of resistance by way of movement and surprise is fundamentally good strategy. Perfect strategy would produce a victory that would be virtually bloodless. Conversely, bad strategy would entail using the direct approach. Grand strategy, therefore, necessarily requires ends-means consistency in order to have any probability of success, in accordance with just war theory, particularly jus ad bellum. If there are no strategic goals, then what milestones could possibly ever be used to measure incrementally progressive successes? The fact of the matter is that reformism has utterly failed to satisfy its burden of proof for demonstrating its very integrity simply because it is strategically unsound for the cause of human liberty. Reformism, simply defined, is any attempt at working inside of the system in order to change it from within. In brief, reformism is applied collectivism. It operates on the presumption that individuals do not matter, and therefore only what the collective wants is what matters in the final equation. Ideologues believe in the sanctity of the centrally planned tragedy of the commons and they falsely justify the precautionary principle to shun market options as any sort of viable response to tyranny, preferring instead the empty moral platitudes of democracy. What this means, of course, is that reformists are not only anti-philosophic, but also anti-empirical. They ridicule the twin libertarian maxims of the non-aggression principle and the self-ownership axiom, while also willfully ignoring the regulatory capture inherent to central planning, or the tragedy of the commons as a negative externality itself. Reformists, truth be told, worship their superhuman deity called government whenever they insist Americans are just one more law away from utopia. Worst of all, reformists have the unbelievable gall to insinuate that their critics should be dismissed out of hand because they are allegedly free writers. For three years, I have periodically addressed some technique of reformism that promised the moon to desperate men and women seeking any remedy that might alleviate their grievances. Each and every single time, without fail, my examinations into these methods reveal the grotesque face of modern American democracy. A listed bibliography of the entire series is as follows. Should you avoid the news? Debating does not work. Should you write a letter to the editor? Writing your congressman does not work. Petitioning does not work. Voting does not work. Protesting does not work. Grassroots lobbying does not work, a review of Chris Cantwell's Anarcho-Lobbyist series, Season 1. Running for public office does not work, why infiltrating the state is foolish. Filming government agents does not work. Suing the government does not work. Lawsuits are not useful for securing your liberty. The activist legal defense fund scam and jury nullification does not work. Whether it be elections, juries, or the news cycle, I think it is more than fair to say that the efficacy of the ballot box and the jury box can be safely judged to be insufficient for restoring liberty. Although I still have some faith in the soap box as a vehicle primarily for education, I am not naive enough to believe that the soapbox alone will prevent democide, which, as the inevitable end of statism, will force you, sooner or later, to choose between the immediate fate of the pine box or a chance at liberation through the ammo box. 
For instance, the proliferation of alternative media websites has inadvertently promulgated a culture of gossiping and rumor mongering. Counterproductive debates between libertarians and statists are hosted by outfits that should know better than to place these very different folks in the same room. Writing letters to Congress critters and editors of corporate newspapers not only disrespects individual privacy, but prolifically wastes the human labor invested in persuading those who will never read such letters. Petitions for redressing grievances are systematically ignored, and no voter can rationally evaluate which candidate would become the best elected ruler. Begging for the rulers to solve your problems while yelling like a hooligan on the streets just demonstrates, pun intended, that you don't deserve to be free, and neither does begging the rulers more politely at their own headquarters. Much like the corporate newspaper editors, politicians establish barriers to entry so as to further entrench their thrones from being challenged by hapless Americans. Government agents cannot be held accountable at all, and no amount of filming or suing them is going to change that fact. Finally, should you find yourself in legal hot water, Socializing your court costs onto strangers by begging or guilt-tripping them into doing so is utterly repugnant, especially if the money is ultimately funneled towards something else entirely. An explication about jury nullification is warranted here. Out of all the reformist techniques, jury nullification is, by far, my favorite of the bunch. Yet, unlike Larkin Rose, I am not at all convinced of its efficacy in securing liberty as well as the fact that unlike every other single method I've written about, it's the only one that's coercive, mainly because of what statists call jury duty, which uses initiatory force in fabricating a sense of legitimacy towards either condemning humans who have harmed no one or in excessively punishing those who have committed an injury to another. If Shane Radliff's experience in being coerced by the Illinoisan McLean County government into serving as a juror just so he could be forced to convict a woman of felony scratching for which she is currently rotting away in a government dungeon for the next four years tells us anything about the power of jury nullification it would be that nullification was immaterial to her case yet it may change complicit in giving a sense of legitimacy to the state above and beyond his objections to the whole freak show in light of this, what value does jury nullification have to offer us in terms of shrinking the power of the state? I'd say about as much as habeas corpus et subjuciendum at this point. Pragmatism is often touted by reformists as the sole justification for their failed uh, methodology. Larkin Rose already debunked this nearly two years ago. Quote, most activism is completely worthless. In fact, it's worse than completely worthless because it accomplishes more harm than good. I speak from experience. Many, many years ago when I still believed in statism, I was politically active and I campaigned and I played those games and I wrote my congressman and did all that stuff. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it now. But yeah, I did that too. At the time, I really and truly believed that I was fighting the right fight, that I was fighting against the beast. It only occurred to me many years later that I was actually feeding the beast lots and lots of fuel." Close quote. He's absolutely correct, particularly when you consider that reformists never measure the efficacy of their own solutions. For all of their talk about the virtues of playing the game, consider then how many elections have been won, how many unjust laws have been repealed, and how many cops and bureaucrats have been personally impoverished or even fired for their abuse of corruption. I believe the right adage here would be, the silence is deafening. The vainglory permeating reformist sophistry grows the misconceptions they perpetuate. Legal remedies such as reclaiming unclaimed property or expatriation are not reformist, sim simply because their goal is to assist dissidents in avoiding or escaping the state, as opposed to infiltrating it in order to remake it in their own image. Special interests like secret societies, various flavors on the demographic kaleidoscope, 
the corporations, etc., are the convenient boogeymen touted by reformists to be the problem, instead of understanding that the real problem standing against human freedom is the idea of authority itself. Perhaps this will make sense to you once you comprehend the fact that most conspiracists are reformists. Contrarily, not all minarchists are reformists, yet too many of the anarchic philosophical schools tolerate reformism. Direct action, that is, the economic means of making money, is lambasted by reformists as either impractical or dangerous. If anybody is to be accused of being limited hangouts, it would be the reformists themselves, as evidenced by Naomi Wolf's proclamation to the Free Staters during the 2014 New Hampshire Liberty Forum that, quote, we need the state, we need to become the state, close quote. Everything I've done to free myself has either been done alone or in concert with other individuals in fluid affinity groups. The best repudiation of reformism I can figure, at least in terms of a legalistic solution, would be to cancel your voter registration. I proved it worked in Texas, and Shane proved it worked in Illinois. So it is possible to revoke your individual consent to be governed, at least to that extent. Reformism is a negative externality itself, mainly because it unduly increases opportunity costs by tricking people into thinking that the political means of making money is somehow inexplicably viable for securing individual liberty. This foundational basis for reformism ought to be met with public ridicule, open scorn, and widespread contempt by both patriots and libertarians. At this juncture, the term activist might as well mean reformist. Might I suggest that, in order to distinguish ourselves from reformists, patriots and libertarians henceforth describe themselves as freedom outlaws? You've just heard Reformism Does Not Work, a critique of political activism, originally published at the Last Bastille blog on July 16th of 2015 and read to you by the author. Afterward, readers of the Last Bastille blog, as well as other content producers within the alternative media, have asked me over the years why I thought this series debunking reformism was indispensably vital to the cause of securing American liberty. Originally, it all began with a conversation I had with none other than Randy Mack of You Have Tread On Me Radio. When I told him how much I despised working within the system in order to change it, he replied by telling me that I should look at all the other methods and then turn each of these articles into a series. Three years later, that's exactly what I've done. Misinformation and disinformation are lethal to freedom because they increase opportunity costs. There are people I have known personally who would have used the economic means of making money, but instead opted for the political means, simply because they still believed in the false viability of reformism itself. This anthology was written for them, as much as for anyone else who sincerely cares about human liberty. To loosely paraphrase the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 12, we must separate the weed from the chaff by first recognizing the chaff for what it is, casting it into the fire, and then evaluating the remaining varieties of wheat on their own merits. Some of that chaff, which deserves to be mentioned here, are those false friends, whether they be advocates of an Article 5 convention or those oath-breaking oath-keepers and constitutional sheriffs who might as well be the king's guards. Rewriting the Constitution of 1787 before the many local committees of safety have wrested control away from the enemy rebel government is downright foolhardy. And in the interest of peace, 
I sincerely encourage those blue coats to find a more honorable profession before Americans begin using them for target practice. Six months ago, I published the Restoration Trilogy, so I hope this anthology has convinced you to ditch the ballot and jury boxes alike. It is my sincerest intention that I was able to persuade you into discarding the political means forever. I agree with Shane. Much like how the answer to security theater is security culture, the answer to reformism is indeed direct action. Kyle Rudin, Austin, Texas, July 2015. You've just heard An Elusive Phantom of Hope, a critique of reformism by Kyle Reardon, narrated to you by the author. To order the paperback version, please visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash I P O H. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash I P O H. And while you're there, make sure to check out the rest of our catalog for more books, privacy tools, and apothecary items. Liberty Under Attack Publications, share your story, find your freedom.